Yo guys, I've got a spark which I'm going to use to ignite the fire for another YouTube video here on the channel. Exactly one year ago today, I uploaded my biggest ranking video ever. We're talking about all 167 unique scanners ranked from worst to best. Like all of my other rankings, however, this has already became outdated as my opinions on these characters are always changing. So I slaved away making up this ranking list all over again for the two year anniversary of the original video. That's right, for today's premiere I give you a ranking of all 167 unique scanners from worst to best revised for 2022. After today I'll only revise this list every three years rather than every two years, that is if I'm even doing YouTube in 2025. Speaking of the future, over the next couple of hours I'm going to share a lot of opinions about a lot of Skanders very quickly. It's also non-scripted and for the most part done in one take so please forgive all of my upcoming stutters and misspeakings and all that. So the main takeaway from this is just to not be offended if your favourite characters are low on my list. Emphasis on the fact that this is my list is simply just my personal opinion. Feel free to express yourself in the comment section below, but do so respectfully. This list isn't intended to change your minds on certain characters, so don't let your opinions be swayed about what I think of these characters. That's not the intention of this video, or the intention of this video even. You see, I'm stuttering already over here. I also can't please everyone, but there are too many characters to do such a thing. Before we roll that intro and get into the final ranking, here are a few final notes. Minis, reposes, elites and variants aren't included in this ranking. For a character to be unique, they need to have a unique design and moveset, so this means supercharger revamps are also included, as both their designs and movesets are completely rehauled, sometimes for the better, other times not so much. And for a lack of a better way of putting it, they're nothing like their original counterparts. To create this ranking list alone took me several hours, but I'm happy with the one I currently have. Note that a lot of these placements are very compact, meaning that the difference between something like number 100 and number 64, for example, is pretty small. We're talking maybe the difference between 6 to 7 out of 10. That's what happens when you have so many amazing characters to rank. This ranking also won't match up with the individual rankings I made for the cast of each Skarnas game. Except for the Giants course, that one is pretty much the same. Between Locks and the Soul Seekers playthroughs, my opinion on some of these characters have changed drastically, which is why I find that those old ranking videos are no longer accurate. Stay tuned to the end for a quick breakdown of those new rankings. Now with all of this finally out of the way, let's roll the intro and get into ranking all 167 unique Skarlers. Coming in at 167 is my new least favourite character of them all. It's a magic character, it's a core character, and it comes from the very first game. That's right, Overtaken Blastermind is my least favourite Skarn of all time. It's Wrecking Ball! Now I can see how some people have a certain connection to this character, especially given that he released in Spyro's Adventure, so he is basic nostalgia bait, plus to certain eyes he could be conceived of as pretty cute. I, however, don't find him to be either of those things because I have no nostalgia for him from Spice Adventure despite the fact that I got him as my 12th character I believe and say even back then I despise the character and I still despise him to this day the burps they kind of gross me out I'm not the largest fan of them plus they barely even work half of the time they are just kind of like concentrated in front of you and then when you charge them up they don't do a great job of spreading out so, he's just not very good character dealing with crowds, because even this Tomo attack, it takes so long for him to swallow an enemy that leaves him vulnerable for a while. His Wrecking Ball doesn't really flow into other attacks very well unless you pick the right path, and that's the only benefit he has, that Wrecking Ball path. But otherwise, his character's gameplay is garbage, and his design is a glorified bowling ball. I mean, all the way he is is an orb with arms and legs. I don't get the appeal. Hence why Wrecking Ball is my least favourite Skander. But 166 is Crusher, the epitome of slow pace. He 
has some really powerful attacks, and that's about the only good thing going for him. And I suppose the design is also pretty cool, having a helmet with, uh, you know, sunglasses that create laser beams that freeze you and turn you to stone. I'd say it's definitely a cool concept, but unfortunately the gameplay really butchers this character for me. Again, given how slow he is, the fact that he can only really concentrate on single enemies once again. So ultimately, Crusher is a character that I don't find fun, and his design... Well, he's Rock Golem, and that in his franchise has been done over and over and over again, so over the years he's just became less forgettable, really, as better Rock Golems have came in and kind of flew him, uh, flew him way far from the slate of the best Rock Golems in Skarners. In fact, he's both the worst Giant and the worst Earth character, so what does that go to show you? But 165 is going to be Sprocket, the worst Giants core and the worst tech character in my personal opinion. This character could have been so great if her moves actually did more than like 5 damage. You think that's an exaggeration? She is incredibly weak. Her moves are so unique as well, like having mines that you can uh, launch into enemies using your wrench. It's the exact same thing as what Boomer does for his soul gem, so I do find that pretty uninspired. But she can go into a tank for Pete's sake. Oh wait, but it's barely manoeuvrable, it's slow paced, and it's not as fun as it sounds. And all of her other moves, they just are so slow to set up. And the power does, it does not make up for it, and it doesn't help the pacing either. So Sprocket kind of sucks. For 164, we have Drill Sergeant, a design which can be quite cool. I like the details, and his drills are a nice little uh, coloured spiral, but apart from that, he's just a robot, and for a tech element, that feels incredibly uninspired, because there are several robots in the tech element, but at least they all have something unique going for them, rather than being just a bare-bones robot. And Drill Sergeant is also incredibly slow-paced. How can he have that when he has a charging ability that dashes him forward? Well, it's simple because his attacks have such a long cooldown. Even when you acquire the rocket's path, it still feels like you're waiting forever for rockets to reload. And so naturally, just for waiting around, the slow paceness it makes a character not fun, in my opinion. But next up, we move on to 163 for worst trap master, as well as the worst fire scander. It's Kaboom. He has dropped down to be my least favourite trap master because I hate how unbalanced he is. He has a very large hitbox, very weak attacks, and a very low health bar. Those all spell out disaster for higher difficulties, and trap masters are supposed to be better than this. When you compare him to other trap masters, well, he got obliterated in the trap master lot, unlike the rest of them. And a bolt died before him, but that's because he was dealing with Chef Pepper Jack. I would hate to see uh, Kaboom in that fight because one of his attacks you never use because of a really long cooldown. Another attack you don't even use because, again, you're far too vulnerable, which is the last thing you need when you die in two hits. And then for cannonballs, you just wind up spamming, and even then, it's not as effective as Trigger Happy, it's not as fun as Trigger Happy, um, and it feels uninspired because it's just like Trigger Happy. Yeah, Kaboom is lame, but moving on, we have Warnado at 162, a character with some awful maneuverability. He's the worst air as well as the worst light core. Um, his spin attacks and his tornadoes have to be used in conjunction with one another, so I'm glad that he's not just another spammy character. But even though he's not a spammy character, that still doesn't make his moveset interesting to me. Like, one of the abilities is wasted on him having flight, but at least in flight he has projectiles and he can do a bit of a slam, so... They do a lot of interesting things with with his moveset, but for me it just doesn't come together very well, and like I say, it's just for lack of agility and for um, lack of maneuverability that makes him more slow paced for me, and I just don't have fun playing for this character despite the really awesome design, I mean he's a turtle on a tornado for Pete's sake, you don't get much better, but speaking of turtles, we have Slobbertooth, I mean he's a turtle, I guess? <laughs> that being said, he is known as Walmart Bash for good reason, his design is very similar, he's for worst sort force core, I think it's worth pointing out, but I just don't like, again, how slow paced he is. You have to get so close and personal with enemies, and being that close is a problem when you don't have the damage output to really compensate for lack of range, so he's not a balanced character, saying flaws is 
kaboom I guess but he is a little bit more uh, fun in the fact that his moves flow together a little bit more nicely you can very easily go from a head swing into a charge forward and then his tail strike move is definitely the saving grace having knock back uh, really evens him out a little bit so overall with a much better design um, I could see myself placing him higher and a much better move set too but I do like the contrast and colours and the shell detail for the figurine itself it's fucking spectacular but moving on from the awful accents, we have Fun Pack at 160 for my worst water scan. Uh, I honestly, once again, do not get why this character is so beloved because, sure, his design is great, barnacle armor is so creative, and him having a massive anchor, boy, it is fairly well ranged. But unfortunately, like when enemies get close, obviously it hones in on them, and that makes it impossible to defeat enemies from far away. So the fact that from Pep can only really hone in on a single enemy and he isn't really effective for crowds. Makes him far from a good scander. He's also really slow, similar to Crusher. In fact, he might even be more slow than Crusher. And his belly flop takes so long to start up and to cool down afterwards. And his chomp is so close to ranged, it really doesn't mesh in well with the rest of the moveset. And his upgrade chamber is so disappointing because it does very little to improve upon him. He has some really interesting animations and combinations, but they don't really add much strategy to the character, at least not from, from the way I'm experiencing him. I could just be bad with a character that is possible, but I don't know. I just don't find his gameplay appealing to my personal playstyle, and therefore I'm placing him at 160 for a personal choice. Now, 159 is the worst swapper, Doomstone. Again, I don't understand why this character is so overhyped because boy, his attacks are so slow. Even to charge him up, it's slow. Why would I want to play over such a slow paced character who isn't even all that powerful? Plus, the designs are really uninspired. I mean, he has a column that acts as a sword, he has a shield, he has a projectile with a little spinny move. I mean, I get the design is pretty cool. He is a. Um, Rock Golem infested with the powers of um, Medusa, you know, the fact that she can, he can turn enemies to stone even. <laughs> it's he, not a she, none of the swappers are a she, but say, Doomstone, his design is fine. Say, it's definitely better than other Rock Golems, it has a little more creativity to it than other Rock Golems. In fact, he has a better design than his uh, Earth Sword Force counterpart, Rubble Rouser, but he's not as powerful, he's not as clever in the moveset department, and his moves aren't as intricate and connected as Rubble Rousers are, so ultimately I find his moveset lackluster, not very powerful, slow paced, and it just results in a character that I'd never really want to play as. Now, 158 is yet another character that I'm going to get ripped to shreds for, but it's Terrafin. Because I don't find that his moveset has that much of a flow to it. Yeah, he has his old one too, which connects to me on a personal scale because I'm a boxer just like him. But his belly flop doesn't really come out of his, um, like, earth burrow very well. His punches can't really be transitioned to after a belly flop. It's just a sequence of attacks rather than the attacks flowing organically and nicely together to make for a fast-paced character because this character is many things. Fast-paced is not one of them. Plus, the jokes get tiresome and with the fact that Chaos owes him five dollars. That guy owes me five dollars! It feels like that's the only personality he has which goes to show the lack of personality he has. So say, Terrafin is just a huge massive letdown for me. A bit similar to 157, our worst undead scar in the Cinder. She's fine, and that's ultimately about it. Her attacks do flow together, which makes her better than everything else on the list so far, but it's flow and attacks and a fast-paced character doesn't make her efficient in combat. Like, sure, she's fun, but that fun is very short-lived when you're dying very easily. Um, and plus, it's just rinse and repeat the same old gameplay that gets stale after a while, because all you do is you phantom dash, and then you turn around and you electrify them. You can't even use a third attack because it's a flight, which is a waste of attack, because you aren't actually doing anything with that attack. All you can do is traverse over water, which was, you know, dropped from Spyro's Adventure onwards, or Giants onwards, I should say. So, ultimately, Cinder is a character that has aged. She's far too simplistic, and because of that, she just really pales in comparison to other Scarlet's, which is why she's 157. If there was 156 worse characters, she'd be number one, but that's not the case now, is it? Without further ado, though, we jump out of the top ten with Blastermind. Yes, that's right, Blastermind, uh, 
raised a few spots, so he's now no longer the worst magic character. He's not even the worst trap master anymore because rather than, um, or unlike Boom, I should say, he has an interesting moveset. It's awful in execution, but I like the unique ideas with him. He can create um, levitating enemies, he can turn enemies against one another, he can, you know, create a slam, which takes far too long, by the way. But the fact that you can deal damage whilst you're charging up is pretty cool. There's definitely strategy to this character, unfortunately, for strategy hardly ever pays off. Because on easy mode, you're only having enemies deal easy damage to one another, so if they never kill each other off that way, it's too low of a damage. Uh, and on Nightmare, uh, few of our enemies are killing the other enemies very quickly and too easily. So, say, either way you spin it, the attacks just don't really work, they don't last, um, they don't flow. So they are unique, and with excellent strategy, you can be really rewarded, but ultimately, Blaster Mind is still a really lackluster character in terms of gameplay, and his figurine is even worse. I don't like the shape, it's not a fun toy to mess around with because it's just so twig-like, which is too relatable to me in real life. I hate it, like characters like Terrapin where he's a boxer, and that's a perfect amount of relatability, but someone being a stick-like figure, too humanoid, like Skanders is a cartoon, be more cartoony, be more creative with the shapes you use, rather than just, like I say, creating a twig, or a dull trap master indeed. But 155 is going to be the character that I nickname Super Shit Stealth Elf, because that sums her up perfectly. Now, of the eight base elements, Life was the last to pop up with the worst character of its respective element. That, of course, being Super Shit Stealth Elf. Now, what's so like luster about her, I hear you asking? Well, switching out her daggers for a gun, first of all, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would a ninja use, like, a Gatlin Quarter? Um, it completely shifts up her gameplay, not for better. Instead, you're focused on knocking back enemies and then firing off your Gatling gun at them. There no longer is any intricate stealth needed for this gameplay. In fact, the stealth feels tapped on and really forced. So, the fact that they so drastically changed the gameplay for the worse, if it weren't broke, why were they trying to fix it? Super Shot Stealth Elf is weak, not fun. I love the details on her design, you know, her suit is incredibly cool, but that's just about where my praises for this character begin and end. Now, 154 is Dune Book. I love the colours, they're very shiny and contrasting, and his design is unique, you know, he's a bug, Dune, bug, uh, a beetle type design is the words I'm looking for here, but it's unique, there's no other skyers like it, but unfortunately his gameplay... This is what Force we're talking about, where most characters who fly do so by double tapping the jump button. Why is his tertiary attack still a flight ability? It's a waste of an ability. It doesn't give you anything besides, you know, a little bit of extra speed and maneuverability. I'd rather have an actual attack. And speaking of those attacks, Dune Bugs are useless. You can only contain small enemies in his, like, uh, rolling ball, which, sure, you can eat off the ledge, and that's very satisfying. But that's just about the only thing this character's good for. His projectiles are slow, not very powerful. They have a fun sound effect, and that's about it. So the character is fun, getting, listening, uh, getting to listen to the sound effects. But again, that fun is short-lived because he's dying very quickly because his projectiles are bloody useless, and even when you charge uh, up projectiles to get a slightly more powerful attack, they still don't really pan out and defeat enemies with ease, but 153 is going to be Jetpack, a character who literally sucks. His gameplay is a bit of a loop, because all you do is suck on enemies, and then you blow him back out again using his Vacuum Blaster for a mix of knockback and pulling in enemies is a really unique one and I love his design I mean he's an eagle with a vacuum blaster for Pete's sake that is cool he has nice contrasting colors too it makes for a great legendary form I have nothing wrong with the figurine whatsoever it's just again the gameplay loop it's repetitive it's dull and compared to other scarners it's not even all that powerful so you have no reason to pick jet vac over several better scounders, but 152, well, let's just say if the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because uh, Jetpack's predecessor also sucked. Hurricane Jetpack is just Jetpack, but with saw blades, and saw blades are automatically cooler than just gusts of air, so that is the only thing giving Hurricane Jetpack a slight advantage over his previous versions, that and also I think design is much cooler for gun, 
is much cooler and I love his armor plus the flick kick does a greater job at creating knockback for enemies so you can really knock them back pull them in knock them back again uh, it really is a loop where you're trolling them in a way you're messing around with them and that can be pretty fun even though again it's a gameplay loop that's repetitive and dull after five minutes but 151 is going to be Gorilla Driller. Now we're starting to get into characters that are at least bearable for me. Uh, Gorilla Driller is a character to where I just don't connect with his design. I don't connect with his uh, moveset. His bottom half is very good. So you combine him with better top halves and you have a decent sky there. But Gorilla Driller's top half, his punches are too short ranged. Uh, the damage doesn't compensate for that. And punches as well pretty lame and generic and he also calls down monkeys it's a funny attack but not one i find using all too often due to the cooldown it doesn't pair well with the punches very well and outside of the sound effect say it's just not that fun it's just kind of like a twist on a projectile when it could have been so much more grander in execution i suppose so gorilla driller he's just too much of what you expect like he's a monkey you expect monkey attacks and when you get that you're kind of let down by the lack of surprises and therefore gorilla driller is just shy of top 150 which is kicked off by head rush a character with some really unique ideas i love her drifting mechanic of being able to build up some damage um it's really cool but her attacks don't flow together very well in fact her stomp leaves so much cool down that again it's not worth using like uh kaboom second attack all over again her yodel again leaves you too vulnerable and her charge attack it's just not maneuverable enough and it's too close range like because you don't have invincibility whilst using it and you're still exposed from all corners she just isn't very good at attack and combat because of a large hitbox at least at the bare minimum she has a health bar that is high to deal with it unlike kaboom she can die and oh my god three hits rather than two it's a miracle but now we're going to move on to 149 which is going to be sunburn unfortunately a forgotten sky from spice adventure the only one who never returned to any capacity and you know what i'm sorry to say but it's kind of deserved i mean he's a phoenix fire dragon that design is cool but the move set is not the phoenix dash leaves you so exposed and the cooldown is so long that any speed you garner from it is immediately lost and it's not exactly like the damage makes it a move worth using uh worth using even you use it for the speed and saying the speed is directly lost afterwards there's no momentum it doesn't flow into anything besides maybe the teleport which also doesn't flow into anything so he's not a fast-paced character the only thing i like doing with his character is building up his flamethrower but because that's directly in front of you as soon as an enemy gets behind you um to turn around his agility is very slow so you've got to stop the flamethrower and build it back up again so what's the point in having a build up mechanic if you can't even maintain the build up for multiple enemies when they surround you he's terrible with crowd control and i just don't have the most fun playing with him he's pro well he's no doubt more powerful than the wii version of spire's adventure and i'm basing this on the xbox 360 version unfortunately because that's the version i play but this is a personal list and i'm going to base it on my personal experiences my apologies to all the sunburn fans out there but speaking of the uh, fan bases we have the hex fan base <laughs> i really do apologize because 148 hex i don't like how fragile the figurines are like these are designed to also be toys so why make toys as fragile as this hex is a display piece and a display piece only so she doesn't function well as a toy how about as a character in the game well, I like her bone walls, the fact that they deal damage when enemies walk into them, and her skull rain too is a really unique mechanic. It's a high risk, high reward. You are slow, you are exposed, but after the build up, you deal so much damage. Her projectiles are kind of generic though. I like how far they travel and how fast you can mash them, but that doesn't take away from the fact that they're just, you know, undead orbs that she's firing at enemies. There could have been a little bit more creativity there. And not to mention, other characters have the exact same moveset executed to better perfection. So I just find Hex not as good when compared to other Skylanders. And I think her design and her figurine itself have something to be desired. Now moving on, we have Riptide 147. I love the figurines like posing. It's really good at conveying the personality of Riptide as he's almost kind of an arrogant 
don't understand where the arrogance comes from because he's kind of weak in game. Again, he has to get far too up close and personal with enemies. He just uh, he does pounce onto enemies even when he uses attacks. But say there's just no bounce in his attacks. He just wind up using the hammerfish because it's so much more powerful and it's almost the same speed as the swordfish. So that takes away all the strategy instantly. And for massive whale, whilst it is fun to yell, massive whale. It's just not so fun for the actual attack itself because it leaves you so exposed. It's not powerful enough, it's not ranged enough, and it just focuses in on enemies in front of you. So this character has no sense of crowd control, his attacks don't really flow, and there's no balance. So you only find yourself mashing the same attacks over and over again, and that's just a really stale and repetitive gameplay loop. Now, moving on, we have Nightfall at 146. Finally, the worst dark has shown up. Now, Nightfall is. Um, a stealthy type character similar to super shit stealth elf but also better than her much better than her um sneaking up on enemies to unleash powerful melee attacks is just a far superior way of going about it not to mention the hair is glorious something that i can really relate to um the claws are awesome she is just such a dark and intimidating figure that's exactly what a dark scarner should be I just don't think her moves flow together all too well, and she's not nearly powerful enough to justify the gameplay strategy, uh, the demanding gameplay strategy. Like, you have to be seriously good for this character to be any good whatsoever. Um, so, she really needed some buffs to be considered as a good supercharger, in my personal opinion. But now we move on to tough work and if you don't like the way how i pronounce it well that's just tough work isn't it um she's a meme character to me which is why i find her so much fun to play as like sure her moveset's nothing to write home about she has stealth with her clovers which is very generic we've seen this done before and she has a pounce which again we've seen done before she's kind of like a combination of stealth elf and scratch but not nearly as good as both of them her combinations are well animated and she does have interest in crowd control via said combinations and the fact that she's a cat with two short titanium blades, again, it's cool, there's a sharp colour contrast going on there, and I like the figurine, I like the memes I created with my constant mispronunciation of her name, but her gameplay is just a little bit too generic and stale for me personally. So moving on to 144, this is where I start to at least like the Skarners, that just goes to show how many good Skarners are off, we're getting to 144 and already I'm starting to like them, but needless to say, the 144 spot is going to be Whamshell, a character whose moveset once again doesn't really flow, he's slow paced but he is incredibly powerful and being a crab with a mace is just such a unique and well executed concept and I love his swimming animations in Sparrow's Adventure, he literally just, uh, you know, rides on top of his mace like it's a broom so the ideas behind this character are really creative and it's a really inspiring type design, inspired me in a way that makes me want to be creative um, and, and to say it's not like the attacks are bad, they're well animated, they're just slow paced really and dull so those are the only things I don't like about Whamshell and the fact that his primary and tertiary attacks are the only ones you use. The secondary attack is a waste because for starfish don't deal nearly enough damage they're not nearly enough ranged either. Now 143 is going to be a rupture yet you have a slow paced and kind of dull character. His uh, shapes aren't all that interesting. He doesn't have hands which is unique but instead they're just replaced by like fire, limb, thingies and he's just once again an orb so there is no interest in cartoony over complex shapes of this character it's dull i like detail though the lava flowing through it and save moves it definitely isn't bad it's pretty powerful but it's a little too close ranged for attacks don't really flow and he's slow paced now moving on we have rubble rouser at 142 a character which is so much better than Doomstone. He has attacks that flow together much more nicely. The animations are really crisp and nice to watch and fall before you. They really give you a sense of power as you're hammering around with your, well, hammer. The sound effects are also really satisfactory on top of it all. So, Rubble Rouse is a character I enjoy. I wouldn't say he's perfect, especially in the design department, because it's so boring. He's just a ran, uh, a, a standard run-of-the-mill rock golem, should I say. In fact, compared to Crusher, it's even more lame and uninspired. He has a hammer. Crusher has a hammer. Crusher's hammer is bigger, though, so I'm sure Bulkhead has something to say about that. <laughs> Mine's bigger. All jokes aside, we're going to move on to 141, which is Nightmare, a character that really grew to me during the Trap Team uh, France lock. This is because 
Turns out she has some really interesting tools in her moveset that can be used uh, strategically to, again, really reward players who think outside the box when playing as this character. The way her moveset is built up and her incredibly unique design just makes her stand out amongst other Skarners because, sure, she does have slashes and dashes. Aren't, uh, they aren't the most creative um, moveset elements, but they pair well with everything else to make for a complete moveset that's really jank and I don't like her lack of maneuverability and the hitbox size so there definitely is weaknesses behind his character but a centaur with a really unique shaped sword you don't get much cooler than that now 140 is big ball hot fizz yet again another character where he wasn't broke so why did they even attempt to fix it the problem here is that the beast mode is no longer high risk high reward in fact if anything it's just low risk low reward it doesn't take long to transform there is no timer but it's a lot weaker and a lot of the appeal of pop in the first place was just having those few seconds to go and absolutely ravage your enemies with something so over the top and incredibly broken and you don't get that big ball pop fizz the figurine isn't as exciting either i mean it's just pop fizz but rather than a potion you have uh, his musical instrument i forget the name of you see it's just not very memorable big ball pop fizz i'm not Clearly not a fan, and it's such a shame that this design lets me down to a point of Pop Fizz was a legendary Skarner, not literally, but still. To be let down with this as a revamped version, and yes, I do use air quotations for the revamped part. What a massive letdown indeed, and he gets 140, but 139 are worst trap team core. That goes to show how good all the trap team cores are if the worst one is only just appearing now. But in my personal opinion, it's Flipwreck. I love his design, and his name is so incredibly clever, I mean, he's a dolphin, so he has flippers, and he has parts of the shipwreck, but a shield and a sword, not very unique, and the fact that the third attack and the sword lunges you forward, it gives you no maneuverability, there's no flow in his moveset, it's just terrible um, agility, makes for a slow-paced moveset, he has the same problems as Warnado, and the fact that his moveset is just jank, not very fun, it's slow-paced, it's not powerful, just everything I don't want in a moveset is kind of all conjured here together. And it makes for one of the most overrated characters in my personal opinion, and one of the only trap team cores that I would dare say is overrated to begin with, and that clearly isn't as good as the others, because he's not as powerful, he's not as fun, he's not as fast-paced. So therefore, he gets a very much deserved 139, but 138 is a character where, oh boy, I'm going to get a lot of slack for this, but it's Hot Dog. It's where things start to get average for me, and Hot Dog's design and moveset are just the epitome of average. I mean, all what he did is make a dog who's been put on fire a literal hot dog. They came up with a pun first and then designed the character around the pun. And his moveset really lacks because of it. I mean, he can create firewalls, he can do a pound, he can do fireballs, fireballs alone are unoriginal enough, and then for the rest of the moveset doesn't really make up for that, so he's a character that's basically just average, he does average damage, he do, he has, um, you know, the average moveset that kind of flows, kind of doesn't, um, you know, there are so many, like, balancing factors to this character that makes him just the dictionary definition of average to me. Now, 137 is Spyro. I do admit, obviously, he has his um, iconic background, and I love the fact that they was able to take such a beloved character and do him justice in the Skarners franchise. I know Spyro fans would disagree with me on that one there. And say, the game in history alone is definitely enough to raise Spyro for me, given his iconicness, but I have no nostalgia for his original game, so I'm just looking at this purely from a Skarner standpoint. And yes, the design does stand out. He's a purple freaking dragon for Pete's sake, but he's also a magic scarlet that sprouts out fireballs. That makes no sense to me. And also, having fireballs and a charge doesn't make him a powerful or standout character from a moveset standpoint because pretty much every character can do that. There's nothing unique about him, and it's not exactly like his power is anything to write home about. So, Spyro is just yet again the epitome of average. But moving on to 136, we have Stink Bomb, a character who is very much projectile based, and I'm okay with that. But, um, say you can sneak around, and that stealth type gameplay has been done before. I think Stealth Hog does it better just because it's more risky and more satisfactory to have to get up close and personal enemies while sneaking around with melee attacks. Doing it with projectiles is just not nearly as fun. You can charge projectiles too, and you've got to have appropriate aiming because otherwise your charge attacks go to waste. 
uh, as you can only do it like in front, behind, and to either side of you. So it's just a really nice built-up move set that flows well enough. But unfortunately, you have to get too close and personal with the punches. And why do that when you have ninja stars? And ninja stars in and of themselves are pretty generic. Like right? they're just a standard run-of-the-mill projectile attack that they inserted here because they couldn't think of any more unique projectile to do with a life swap and then just give him ninja stars. So there you go, stink bomb at 136, but 135 is going to be Trailblazer, who was once my least favourite trap team core, but since then I've kind of moved past uh, my bias against the design because I'm not the biggest fan. It's not something that connects to me personally. I can see like a My Little Pony enthusiast fall in love with design like this one. I mean, in the, in the end of the day, it's a horse on fire with a nice suit of armor. I love the attention to detail and the figuring itself is well textured. It's fun to play around with because it's also firm. It's not fragile unlike Hex. Um, but Trailblazer ultimately has some really overpowered gameplay. Like, sure, you don't find yourself ever using the secondary attack because its hitbox is janky and it doesn't have good enough knockback and it's too close range and it doesn't deal enough damage so again there is no balance there. The tertiary attack is great down the right path because you have the trailing uh, horses beside you and you can um, deal damage with less risk in other words because you can charge close to an enemy whilst also avoiding them but you've dealt damage to them whilst not having been dealt damage um, to yourself. So it's cool, and projectiles say um, fireballs are generic, but at least they're dealing damage here. So it's an effective character in combat, even if I'm not the biggest fan of the design and the moveset, could definitely be a lot less generic. And now I move on to 134, the worst Sensei Crash Bandicoot. Now I love how well this moveset flows together. Crash Bandicoot is really fast paced and makes for an excellent brawler because of his combinations working with such fluency. But. Compared to other senses, it's just not nearly as powerful and chaotic. It really is the simple fact that this is a comparison ranking video. And when compared to other characters, Crash Bandicoot is a massive disappointment because of the lack of power he has. No, longer why, uh, no wonder why he has extra lives even, because he's constantly losing health. He has to get close and personal with enemies and he's not defeating them quickly enough. It's a really great representation of the character with a moveset because they bring back his old moves from the old Crash Bandicoot games and it's just so nostalgic for those of you who would have grown up those games. Again, I have no personal connection here to those games, so therefore, as a character, Crash Bandicoot isn't one that I personally connect with, so therefore, there isn't as much of a character for me to resonate with. I don't feel that personal tether into the character like other people would, so he loses points for me there just because of personal stuff that's happened in my life, that's what opinions are based on at the end of the day, personal experiences, and I have none of that for Crash Bandicoot, so I can see why he's a beloved character, I can see why maybe people even think he's a beloved sensei, but I just can't get behind the weak moveset, even though it flows and it's fast paced, it's such a shame that this is the first time in a in this ranking video where we're talking about such a great moveset that it's just let down by the lack of power and also the molding for him, I just don't think he's as personality driven as other senseis which is a shame because Crash Bandicoot is a character with a lot of body language to utilise and they just didn't really take advantage of it, of it in my personal opinion. But we're going to move on to 133 which is Fryno, a character that like Terrafin I can relate to. He pounds, which I do, I, I pound things, I'm a boxer might I remind you. But he does it out of anger and at the end of the day when I was young I had temper tantrums as you call it, I got angry and so seeing a Scarn who also gets angry kind of makes me feel as though it was okay and that's one takeaway, it is okay to get angry, it's all about the way you express it, don't do it like Frino and pound stuff, then again if you pound stuff, as long as you're not hurting anyone, it's fine, you know, you can pound a pillow all you like, um, but say, really nice how I can relate to him, plus, I mean, he's a fire rhino, that is a really cool design, I love the figurine itself, the horn is a nice little um, thing to play around with, the reds and the blacks contrast each other really nicely, and he can be pretty fast paced, especially after you pound, sure you leave yourself vulnerable, but the buff you get from it makes for a high risk, high reward type situation, so it's definitely uh, fun and intense moments with this character, but ultimately, He's just not very fast paced and punching is such, uh, such a generic move, I wish he had something more to do and his charge ability 
it's nice it uses his horn like a rhino would. There's sort of real life bases there, and then also he can bring out the motorcycle when he pounds. But Hothead did that before, so it just kind of feels uh, derogatory. And there are so many more creative angles they could sort of his character, but they didn't, and so there are disappointing things about him which brings him down. And again, when you compare him to the Scardis, he's just simply not as good. He doesn't stay alive as long, or he's not as efficient as characters like at all. Blackout probably would be ranked 167 if this ranking was based on glitchiness alone, because Blackout is so incredibly broken, and I don't mean in terms of his attack output, I mean in the fact that he will literally make enemies invincible. So he breaks the game in the opposite way in which you want, because you want to annihilate enemies, not be annihilated by them, because when they're invincible, First of all, he can't even attack you, so it's boring. And second of all, whenever you need to defeat all the enemies in a certain area to unlock a bounce pad or a gate, well, you can't do that because now the enemy is invincible just by a simple, even strategy that's encouraged with Blackout. You're encouraged to use your tertiary attack to make enemies teleport between the portals, but if you defeat them whilst being teleported, well, they become invincible. So the very fact that the game encourages you to do something that, break, uh, that fundamentally breaks it, makes this character nigh unusable. You can't use a tertiary attack. Um, the primary attack flows really well. You can actually uh, go into a jumping attack very easily and I love the fact that it becomes a buzzsaw. It's really creative jumping animation and also being able to launch yourself upwards where you aren't being dealt damage to but you're dealing damage to anything below you. It's so overpowered and well animated and he's a really cool looking figurine say for blacks are very intimidating and him being based on a gargoyle is just very clever from the get-go so there's definitely stuff about blackout i love on the other hand he's fundamentally broken he's pretty slow paced at points and he's not as powerful as he needs to be so therefore blackout gets the 130 second spot on the list at 131 i have rocky roll a pretty unique character and for the fact that he combines a little rock golden fella and a massive rock which has a face therefore giving it a personality in and of itself so the figurine is very hollow and naturally not the nicest feeling figurine so again the physicality of it is pretty disappointing though again i do love the design and the design makes up for an interesting moveset but rocky roll doesn't have great maneuverability similar to that of warnado's flaws and he just has kind of like rock projectiles or rock shield you know he can charge forward so his attacks are also pretty generic and they don't really flow together very well but they are powerful and it's well animated it all sounds uh, crisp and polished uh, you could even go as far to say so then actually rocky roll is a character who's far from bad but when compared to other scars he does really fall flat for me which is why he gets 131 but moving on we have starcast at 130 a character with some very powerful projectile attacks and some strategy as well because obviously you want to be invisible as much as possible so enemies can't really sneak up on you and whilst you're invisible you create clones that send off shock waves so you just have every tool available to you to absolutely obliterate folk it's awesome plus the design is great given that he has four arms four ninja stars you know he literally looks like a being of space and of the night because he's got the dark night sky he's full of stars you know he's cast into the stars too <laughs> man my puns are terrible um you know the terrible one i'm one who's laughing at them but this being said and done lobstar just has a really cool figurine his moveset does come together quite nicely even though the attacks don't necessarily flow his jumping attack is an absolute waste because of the lack of of range on it really and it takes a very long time to really build up damage which is why i said earlier that you need good strategy and sometimes sometimes even with this character is quite frustrating i'm also not a large fan of the um lack of agility especially when you're on his uh, little spinning starship thing that bob it's a powerful move to be in but it leaves you so exposed and it's just it might be powerful but not nearly um powerful enough to justify the lack of maneuverability for vulnerability as well as the fact that once again you compare starcast with sensei's and he's just not nearly as powerful now 129 is washbuckler now how do you um beat starcast and his six limbs that's easy, with eight limbs. Washbuckler is the only character to have six legs and two arms, therefore six limbs between a lot of them. He has a bubble gun and a sword, so that's fairly generic, a sword and a gun, but you can trap enemies in your bubbles using the gun and then strike them down with your sword, which hones in on enemies. You literally 
pounce on them, so Washbuckler definitely has some interesting tools to play around with, so even though his attacks are generic, they uh, pair together quite well, he's a fast paced character because he can dash forward if they're holding for the secondary attack button is a literal wasted potential because it's really funny to slap enemies with your tentacles, but because it doesn't deal enough damage quickly enough, you just never really wind up using it. So they definitely have some comedic prowess with this character, and it's cool to see an octopus as a pirate. But ultimately, when compared to other swappers, he's a little bit more generic in the moveset category, and his attacks um, don't make all the most sense because ones where you're more vulnerable and you're waiting longer to actually attack, um, you'd imagine that those attacks would be more powerful, and yet they're not. So we now get to move on to 128, which is Lobstar. A very high risk, very raw character, which makes him just about as fun as he is. Um, his name is clever because, well, he's a lobster that lobs stars. It's genius, really. And having Dropteinium star uh, stars from the get-go, even, that's very creative. They're well-textured, too. They're sharp and really intimidating. So it's a character that you definitely want to pick up and play because he has so much personality poured into that figurine. But unfortunately, the gameplay... Sure, he can be pretty fast-paced with his constant dashing, but it's brought to a crawl when you have to obviously hold him to a boil, and you're left so vulnerable, so... You are rewarded for this in the end, but the amount of times I've died being stupid with this attack. And his health also doesn't help, but at least he can keep his range and be more effective with it in Kaboom, especially when you charge up his ninja stars. But because charging up ninja stars deals so much more damage than everything else, it's the only thing I ever wind up using, even over, like, fully boiling him for a soul gem. So because he becomes a bit of a one-trick pony, he can get dull and repetitive in his gameplay style, therefore he gets 128. But 127 is going to be High Five, a character which um, he feels janky to play because you can press the secondary attack button, but as soon as you start mashing it, like you really should, you do far too many dashes and it really disorientates you. His tertiary attack is an absolute waste because it doesn't have great area effect, it damages you as well as your enemies. So, why use an attack that damages you? That's so anti productive. And his other attacks, they're just kind of generic primary attacks. I love his maneuverability in the battlefield though, he is quick and fast paced so he can outmaneuver his enemies and dashing through poison clouds and power them up is a really unique mechanic and I like how obviously they're ranged too. But unfortunately High Five just is a character that doesn't feel polished enough. I love his design for sure, the sharp colour contrast, the attention to detail and just the creativity that goes into making a racer styled dragonfly and calling him High Five, you know, it's all extremely clever, just not in the moveset uh, department where again the moves are generic, they don't really work all well, uh, all too well together, though they do flow together, that's not exactly what I mean, I just mean the fact that uh, if you press an attack just simply one too many times, which is what his whole moveset is designed to be, it's designed to be a spam moveset, but yet you spam and you wind up in places you didn't intend for, and that's the jankiness behind it, that and also, sure, you can dash through poison clouds and that creates a flow for this moveset, but everything else doesn't flow together, so I suppose that's why I alluded to such things earlier on, but now, without further ado, 126 for our top three quarters of the ranking list, we have Dive Clops. Now, you can really stack up damage for this character, and I love the fact that, once again, you want to use his moves in a specific order strategically to maximise your damage output. You can create mines, send out a solar to destroy those landmines with his big uh, bazooka, so it's a really cool weapon, he has a lot of personality behind him, like that massive eyeball is just a lot of personality there, though unfortunately it's a pretty generic design to me, because it's just a generic dive suit with a massive eyeball, and they've had massive eyeballs for other scars before, it feels very derivative of eyeball, I think they were trying to make that connection between Skanders, you know, purposefully remind you of a Skand from those games prior, but for me, it's just a design that doesn't work, it's too bulky, its shape isn't very exciting, so it just winds up becoming lackluster by comparison. And say, his moves do flow together very well, and really does reward strategy, and it certainly is powerful, but all of those things, you know, being effective in combat doesn't mean he's fun in combat, because it's rinse and repeat the same damn moves. I just don't really ever find myself enjoying you know, Dive Clops. It's ha-ha funny to obviously watch all the enemies on screen be annihilated before your very eyes. That part is fun. Everything else, on the other hand, it just... 
builds up a character that I have no personal connection to, and therefore Diablops really suffers because of it. Now, 125 is the worst light character, and it's also the only case where the worst of their element comes from a sensei, this obviously being Aurora. A character who's great, you've got to combine her attacks, and that's really strategic, and she's very fast-paced too. Though unfortunately, her attack's a little more boring and not nearly as powerful as other senseis. So again, it's that idea of by comparison, she's not nearly as interesting as other senseis, despite the background lore. They gave this character a really nice backstory. There's a lot of personality in the figurine. She seems very agile and skillful, and having a little embodiment of Eon on her chest plate. It's all a fine attention to detail. I love a lot of aspects of this character, but unfortunately, when it all comes together, it just creates for a mediocre sensei that when compared to the others, she's not nearly as powerful. She doesn't have as much of a flow to a moveset. Yeah, it's fast paced and the attacks can flow, but other times, uh, you know, it just feels as though attacks are coming out of nowhere and other attacks were created because they had no better ideas like her tertiary attack. She leaves a sword trap behind and yet it explodes automatically so there's no like strategy behind it unlike Zoo, uh, Voodoo's tripwire even where you can trick enemies into engaging with it. Um, there's just a lot of missed potential there and it could have been so much more of a clever attack that again flowed back into the primary attack and the secondary attack which are well animated too might I say so again it's a lot of character or it's a character even with a lot of high highs but also those lows to bring her down. For me, again, it's my personal silly old opinion and all that but 124 is going to be Hoot Loop. Now, I like this character, they're having an owl with armor and magic projectiles, it's really creative and pretty darn cool, he can teleport around the stage to make for a unique chain of attacks, though he doesn't necessarily flow all too well, you just kind of go from one attack to another, his um, hypnosis or whatever it's called to slow down enemies, it would be great if it weren't for the fact that you have to keep it held down, you have to get very close and personal with enemies, it doesn't deal any damage, so... Sure, they've been slowed down and they can't really attack you, but you aren't doing anything effective with it. You aren't defeating them quickly. Um, to even transition into a teleport afterwards would waste time, and because you're so close to them with that hypnosis move, you might not be getting hit anyway. So, naturally, the moves just aren't as powerful and don't have that oop they really need to push Hoot Loop up higher of the ranking list for me. Hence why he sits here at 124. But 123 is going to be Zook, a character even better than Hex, because you can create walls of cactuses, you can launch up your uh, corn bazooka volley shot type thing, and just create a plethora of cacti in front of you that enemies walk into, they're, deal, uh, they're dealt constant damage by. It's a character whose damage seriously stacks, he is overpowered, it's also really cool seeing that green, yellow, red contrast, it's a very nice and well detailed figurine. Though unfortunately, because a lot of the moveset is just stand back, mash this projectile attack and wait around for enemies to be engulfed by your cactus, it's just not a very engaging moveset style. You can do it with your brain turned off and there's just no satisfaction behind it ultimately for me. And when it comes to comparing him to other Skardas, again he's more simplistic, he's powerful but not as powerful, so naturally this being a comparison um, type video when compared to other Skylanders, Zook just isn't a top tier for me. Now moving on to 122 is Buckshot, a character with one of the strongest designs. I mean, he's a fawn with no pupils. That's kind of freaky and very intimidating, but he has this really majestic bow to make him seriously fit in as a magic bow slinger. That's really creative, having a magic Skylander not have a staff but have a bone arrow instead that fires off magical arrows and he can teleport and send arrows through that teleporter. It's a really creative moveset but again they don't really flow, you just kind of teleport and then you launch off primary attacks and if they go through the teleporter they go through the teleporter. It's really rewarding for strategy's sake but efficiency sake, he's not all that powerful, especially when compared to other senseis. Um, I do like the spread he has, the fact that he fires off multiple arrows at once again adds to the magical feeling of the character, but the teleport brings his pace into an absolute crawl, and because his moves don't flow, and there's no fast paceness to him, 
it just makes for moves that ultimately a massive letdown, especially when the design coming from him is as strong as it is. But 121 is going to be Gusto. It's definitely not a character with as strong a design as Bookshot, mind you, but the gameplay is great. He's really good at keeping his distance. He can pull in enemies, uh, push them back out again, or with a simple push with a secondary button, um, enemies to get up close and personal. You can knock them back with a tertiary attack with the moves. It, they don't flow together, but it doesn't feel like you're just going from one move to another. There's a kind of like in between for him. It's hard to explain, but the best thing about this guy is similar to Zook, he really stacks up his damage. Like he deals 100 damage whilst the boomerang is being launched out, but then it comes back to you as well. The properties of boomerangs really um, are taken to advantage with this move set. And whilst the design isn't my favourite, it's Almost a little bit overly cartoony, but that's because Gusto in and of itself is based off a cartoon, which is awesome. He's based on the French cartoon Asterix, so overall, I might not be the largest fan of the design. Again, it's just not got anything that speaks to me personally, and there's nothing that I connect to with this character. But when it comes down to gameplay, he might have a large hitbox, but he has a great health bar to compensate for that. His attacks do just fine, even when they aren't flowing, even when they aren't fast-paced, they are the epitome of fine. 120 is going to be Slam Bam, the OG character with obviously the forearms. Now his moveset works fairly well, you can create ice prisons and trap your enemies and then Bob Sled straight to them. It's a shame that the move doesn't actually deal any damage until the Wow Pow. So the Wow Pow definitely fixed that, especially since it gives you a nice little jingle which is incredibly fun for the character. And say, his ice attacks just uh, it makes the character very well themed, and I love his combinations, they're well animated and save a strategy of uh, entrapping enemies with your prisons having to be accurate, you know, it's risky, it leaves you vulnerable, and you could overshoot it or undershoot it, but even when you undershoot it, enemies um, have to go around for Ice Prison, and that, you know, maneuverability throws them off again, it all leads back to the clever strategy of this character. And I definitely like him, I like his combinations, they're well animated, it's just a character that I never really liked when I was younger. When I first played him in Spyro's Adventure, I didn't get that personal connection, therefore I have no nostalgia behind this character. And ultimately, it's just for lack of a personal flair to me. Say, it's easy for, for one to like this character. Not for me, though. And this is my personal ranking, so therefore on my personal ranking, Slam Man gets 120. I just feel as though his moves could do with a little more flowing together because you just create an ice prison and then you've got to walk up. There's no ice prison organically flowing into a punch. You just do one and then the other. He's not a fast paced character. He is fun. He is strategic. He is not fast paced. And that's ultimately where his final flaws lie. But 119 is going to be Grim Creeper, a character where you can leave his body, tag enemies, and then when you return to it, you just create an aroma of destruction. It's mad. Um, the strategy and how it can pay off with this character. It's a clever move set, even though we have seen it done before with similar characters like Igniter, but you don't return back to the body afterwards, and this allows his moves to flow organically because you can go straight back into his scythe moves. His tertiary attack is great for knocking enemies back, uh, but once again, like when you knock enemies back, because all of his moves are melee based, you can't really transition back into any attack after um, using the scythe. It's literally only good for creating distance between yourself and enemies, not for a constant stream of destruction where your enemies are just being tossed left, right, and center and obliterated by you. That's not how this character really works. So the lack of an organic flow makes him really slow paced for me. I like his animations and I like the fact that he has decent crowd control abilities with his primary attack, but that makes him a bit of a one trick pony in crowded situations because when you're facing a crowd, you can't use the scythe for a secondary attack because they're only good at honing in on certain enemies. So because of that, Grim Creeper does have his flaws, and when compared to other Swap Force Course, he's just not nearly as good. And his design, I suppose it's fine, I mean, he's an undead character with undead features, it's, it's a little generic to be frank. But we're going to move on to 118 about 50, which is Splat. Her moves are pretty cool, they're being themed entirely around paint and all that, and her being called Splat in the same year where Splatoon had released, it was a funny time in that one. But I love her colours, she is a figurine that really pops due to the sharp colour contrast and she really fits in with the magic element as well despite the fact that it's paint, there's nothing inherently magical about it. I think it would have been better if she had like magic orbs rather than magic paint, but hey, orbs would have been generic so aesthetically they make everything to create unison with this character so everything fits 
even though her attacks don't really flow. She's one of those characters where you just go from one attack to another, there's no transition, and yes, her animations are quite nice, but her attacks aren't too powerful, her melee is too close and personal, and then her range is, is too good and too much more powerful than a melee. Why use a melee when you have the range? So again, it's lack of balance in this character that ultimately makes her flawed for my um, personal tastes. And when compared to the Skyder, she's not nearly as good. But moving on to Hashtag 17, we have Ninjini, a very underrated giant, because when you bring out the combinations with this character, it eliminates the only thing that you can conceive of, which is the flaw of this character, which is her lack of speed. So, she's pretty slow-paced, and moves don't really flow. Like, um, the only time it flows is when you go into a bottle and you come back out of it with the explosion. It's well animated, by the way. And she's certainly a magic scanner through and through, but whilst in the bottle you're just kind of launching off missiles, doing your own thing, your swords and orbs, again, you just go from one attack to another, there is no transition. Um, but for balance within her moveset, having both range and melee, and this time the melee is more powerful, so you want to get up close and personal with enemies, and they are going to get up close and personal with you because of your speed, you can't outmaneuver them. But you annihilate them when they come close to you with your swashbuckling skills. So I can't see why people just see slowness as an inherent weakness. Slowness is bad when it creates for a slow-paced moveset. This isn't a slow-paced moveset, it's just a moveset that doesn't necessarily flow together all that well. And when I say it's not slow-paced, it's medium-paced. You know, as characters way better and characters way worse. Hence why 117 is perfect for Ninjini. But now we're going to move on to 116, which is Enigma, a character that has one of the finest designs. He's so mysterious. He doesn't even have a face. He has translucent plastic. Boy, do I love that figurine you see before you. It is glorious. But the move on the other hand is yet again something that lets him down. You find that with a lot of magic characters. The more cooler the magic design is, the worse the moves it turns out to be because his attacks, they don't really flow. It's a much worse version of Stealth Wolf. And when you turn invisible, you can't actually see yourself. So that makes things more difficult just for the sake of it. Um, I know it makes it so enemies can't see you, but when you can't see yourself, how are you supposed to take advantage of that? His tertiary attack is great. It's a shame you have to get up close and personal with enemies, but if they are foolish enough to get close and personal with you, you do at least have that knockback. Um, and say, you do have minimal range of his projectiles, so it's balanced in the fact that he's a melee orientated character, and you got to use strategy to get around with this guy, you got to play him smart, in other words, like, it's a shame because sometimes I like turning my brain off from just being dumb, stupid, broken. Um, though thought broken movesets do tend to immerse you in the game further and keep the concentration flowing so either way it can work if a moveset is executed to perfection and i can't say enigmas is because like i say turning invisible makes you invisible even to the player i don't get that i don't get why you have projectiles that don't have any range and they are so weak in comparison to other trapmaster attacks and the knockback isn't nearly enough the damage isn't nearly enough for the tertiary ability neither and none of it flows together so enigma is just a character with flawed gameplay that i love and i mean love the design of now 115 is chop chop boy am i gonna get roasted for this in comments because he's a fan favorite and to be fair i can see why i mean he's a skeletal warrior with archean armor is pretty cool but a sword and shield Really? This is what you fall in love with? Two of the most generic attacks you can have in a game like this? His Bone Brambler is great because it has good range and deals exactly the same as the Sword Strike, so why use anything else? I love his combinations, they're well animated, and they can give you some forward momentum, so his combat certainly can be fast-paced, it's just generic is all. And to say, it's another design which, whilst being very cool, it's a design I never personally connect to. I never really cared for Skeletal Warriors or Swords and Shields, I cared for Skarnas that were like that but with their coolness dialed to 11. I just feel like Chop Chop isn't the coolest character when compared to other designs. In fact, they I even say it's a generic character. We've seen Skeletal Warriors before. We've seen armored characters before. All what the developers did for this guy was combine the two together and create a name that's Chop Chop. The name is the lamest part. So Chop Chop is a character that's only going to be 115 for me. Now 114 is going to be Voodoo, a character who literally wears a dragon skull for a mask. That is cool. His axe... And a little generic for his first figurine, but in his elite form, you get to see that his axe is a lot more creative, and it just looks intimidating for his elite form as well. For shine and the gloss on that figurine is great, and also, you have already powerful attacks. Does it need to get three times as powerful? <laughs> Not really, but you just place food on the portal, and all of a sudden, everything is annihilated because his swings are well animated and they're very powerful too. And 
He doesn't just stand still when he attacks, you can maintain his momentum moving forward, there's a risk and reward type strategy to win because obviously you can um, launch yourself to enemies with his zip wire like attack, it doesn't have much range but if you space yourself perfectly you can maximise your damage, you can create magical trip wires that when enemies follow you they are stunned by and dealt massive amounts of damage to, so again he's a character whose damage stacks, it really does build up over time, I love his design. His moveset is just really so unfortunately, and the moveset is also incredibly jank. Half of the time, the zipline doesn't even work, and it leaves you so vulnerable. It's so needlessly risky, and you aren't really all that rewarded for it neither. Sure, there's a little ounce of strategy to it, but for damage of the zipline itself, you might as well just stick with all of his other attacks. So therefore, Voodoo is a character which, once again, surprise, surprise, has good highs, but also really low lows, hence the 114 spot on the list. Now 113 is going to be Blast Zone, and creates a firewall. A bit too similar to Flameslinger, he's a suit of armour that is constantly ablaze. Similar to Igniter, he's basically just a combination of other better SSA scanners, and he even has bombs like, a, I don't know, Boomer? So his moveset is effective, do not get me wrong, and he's fast paced. But his design and his moveset are so generic, and just a combination of other better Skylanders that it makes a character, in my personal opinion, rather forgettable, despite being in the starter pack of all things. Magnus Charge would have been a far superior the starter pack character for Swap Force, not to mention he fits the game just aesthetically as what Blast Zone does. You needed two swappers for the starter pack? Fine! Give us Washbuckler and Magnus Charge for Pete's sake! So, with that being said, Blast Zone is not amongst my favourites. But 112 is Bad Juju. A really underrated character, in my first opinion. I say that while she's at 112, which isn't particularly a great spot, but it's not a bad spot, neither. And that's exactly what Bad Juju is. Not bad, not great either. I love the strategy uh, with her moveset. You are rewarded for practicing and mastering that moveset, being able to leave Juju Jr. out, create lightning shocks around him, enemies around him are shocked by it, they're knocked back when he returns back to you, so you have to keep track of both characters at the same time after you've launched them out, he stays into place and all that. Um, say, it's a moveset that really does demand strategy and your reward if it says strategy, I just don't think it flows all too well, it's not nearly as powerful as other senseis, and it just demands too much time uh, for the output not being as efficient and as fun as other senseis. Why bother learning bad juju when you can learn with much less time for superior characters? So again, it's that idea of comparison. If this wasn't for comparison's sake, so bad, I'd say bad juju is great, a fantastic Skylander, but you compare a great and fantastic scar to someone who's oh my gosh this is amazing all of a sudden you find yourself down here at 112 but for 111 i have fright rider now this is a character i have a personal connection to and a lot of nostalgia for and that is the only thing that's kind of raising him up on the list for me because when i was younger i loved his character and to be fair it's easy to see why he's a fast-paced character like sure his attacks don't really flow um, all you do is charge into combat and then you move into his primary attacks. His tertiary attack is a waste because you're far too vulnerable and it's not nearly powerful enough. But his combinations can be ridiculous. They're well animated, their damage output is huge. One of them is even projectile based and deals 116 damage. So the hitboxes are ridiculously unbalanced. His maneuverability isn't great. Sure, he can charge, but he can charge forward. He can't, um, turn around very easily and it's definitely a unique design i mean you have an elf riding an undead ostrich for pete's sake if that's not awesome i don't know what is i just think fright rider could have been a little bit better in the moveset department but 110 is going to be scratch a character which i need to give um benefit of a doubt because i seem to always have her down the wrong path as hypno sniper says when it comes to Scratch, I love the design. It's based on Egyptian culture, which first of all is insanely cool because getting to see these cultures from places outside of my own experience, seeing that represented in Skanders, being honoured, it's so cool. I get to, you know, take a piece of that culture and place it onto my portal of power. Her attacks are a little generic, you know, she has pounces, she has Scratch based attacks. I picture that, a character named Scratch, can Scratch. Um, I just love the sharp colour contrast, she really pops as a figurine and the design adds a lot to that. So ultimately she's a character that I like the aesthetics a lot more than her moveset, but her tertiary attack pulls enemies in and then knocks them back again. That's a far more efficient move style than what High Five has to offer from earlier. High Five is just a lesser version 
of Scratch's tertiary ability, plus her soul gem to heal up with treasure. It's really dope. But we're going to move on to 109, which is going to be Echo, a character which, after multiple, and I mean multiple, second chances, i kind of grown in love with this character because her attention to detail, the textures on the figurine, she is absolutely gorgeous and a fine display piece. Her gameplay is also fine, like the range and for the damage output is a perfect balance. You have the perfect range and the perfect damage output for a character like this. Her bubbles, once again, need to be used as a trap. You kind of like need to retreat from enemies and then they can walk into your bubbles along the way. You can even create a bubble shield for yourself. It doesn't really do much because I believe you still take damage. I suppose I'm just terrible with it. But you can chain that with your tertiary attack, which is well animated. You jump up and then nosedive into the ground it's seriously sweet and not to mention like her over animations for her idol she's bobbing her head up and forth like her ears are headphones but they're shellfish type things there's just a lot of intricate details that makes this a very thought through figure and say the moveset is fine it's perfect for what it is but the moves don't really flow and she's not as powerful so when compared to other scars echo is just barely shy of top 100 material, but we're going to move on to 108, which is Deep Dive Gilgrunt. Why did they try to fix what wasn't broken? I love his armor, it looks really cool, and it's a massive shame that this armor did not finally get Gilgrunt the variant he deserves. That armor would have looked so cool as a dark version. Like, imagine having him a dark starter pack, Spitfire, the dark hop streak, and then you get the dark sea shadow and stealth off is supposed to go alongside it. No, first of all, we already got Dark Stuff Elf, and second of all, if you had Gilgrunt in there, he's a sea pilot. It'll make more sense for a sea vehicle to go alongside him, so would have been so cool to have seen him in that Dark Edition starter pack. But unfortunately, they just had to give us another Stealth Elf, didn't they? And a version of Stealth Elf, which is super shit, as I like to call it, but enough of about what we didn't get. What did we get with this character? Well, we got a moveset, which is pretty cool. This is why, if this is where the Skander starts to get really good because at the end of the day the attacks whilst they don't flow they are powerful they're medium paced there's um far worse ways this moveset could have turned out but it also could have been better it could have been more streamlined in execution um and, and say i don't mind the pacing but there are just other superchargers i prefer using before i use this guy which is why by the sakes of comparison he's here at 108 so here we go with 107, which is going to be another lightning based Skarner, ironically enough. We have a lightning rod, a character who is insanely powerful. Uh, he is one of those characters whose moves don't really organically flow, he just kind of transitions from one move to another, but that's easily forgivable given, like I say, just how powerful his attacks are. And there's a risk and reward type system to it too. Um, doing his secondary attack, it can obviously have a massive damage output, but it leaves you incredibly vulnerable and you need to control it as well. So there are multiple things with this character that invest you further from the gameplay. His primary attack is a bit of a masher though, and um, I love the tertiary attack though, it makes up for it because you can stun enemies, but it's only when they're up close and personal. So it gives you a way to kind of maneuver around him and add an extra level of strategy so overall lightning rod he's a god and he has the power of one too uh, the figurine is fine i love the fact that he you know lo uh, lobs off little lightning bolts like javelins and his series 2 in particular has a really great detail when it comes to the hair i love the chunky cloud on his base it's overall not a bad figurine, but I've also seen better. Now moving on to 106, we have Chopscotch, a figurine that might just be a glorified orb with a massive axe. Not my most favouritest of things because they could have done so much more with the shapes of this character. But it's made up for by the sheer amount of detail and the texture in here. You truly feel like this is a skull and that you have patterns engraved upon it. And then her gameplay is really fun, it matches up with her personality quite well to create for a smasher that uh, is only really good at focusing in on enemies in front of her, like, for crowd control she does have the moves, but unfortunately for lack of maneuverability she does slow down the pace as her moves don't flow together, but the power more than makes up for it, she just has fun and creative attacks, like she does hopscotch, as chopscotch, you know, she... Um, has really in-depthful animations that look crisp and absolutely gorgeous. She's just a character who's fun to play. It really is as simple as that, even though her design has let her down a little bit. Now, 105 is going to be the original Mama Bird. It's Sonic Boom. I can't believe I just called her a Mama Bird, but she was the original Skander to fight as a family, and it's really kind of an inspirational message, that. But also, she's increased at my ranking list because I just find her so much more powerful now. Like, her babies are great for range. Her screech 
isn't great on range, but you can create a chain of events that means you can maintain distance easily. She's one of those characters who can do things that no other characters can. She can grind through Sparrow's Adventure with ease. She can even fix the game with the fact that when you're failing it for enemy goal, when her babies die, they count towards it for some reason, so it can fix any glitches there. So she's just, she's a useful Skylander, and she's a fun Skylander to play as, and I love the design too. She's like half griffin, half lion. It's so cool. The colours are a little blocky though, there's a little bit too much black and not enough contrast, so the colours don't pop on like other Skylander figurines, but I still love the design, and I love the gameplay. It's a shame that one of the attacks is waste because it's just flight. If we had an actual tertiary attack, Sonic Boom would go from being good to even greater. But for 104, we have Mr. Cat, a really underrated character. First of all, the design is very interesting. It's like a centaur cat type thing, and the projectile attacks work really well. You have to build up for the sake of the power, and you can create clones and go invisible. It's kind of like the perfect amalgamation of things that came before it. So yeah, it's a generic movie set, but it's one that works really well. It doesn't necessarily smoothly transition. It's not fast-paced either, but it is really effective. I do wish Mr. Cat had a little bit more maneuverability, like Nightmare being a character character on all fours just make it a little tough to move around with um, Mr. Cat easily. So the character has his ups and its downs but overall Mr. Cat is a pretty decent character and worthy of being just outside of the top 100. But next up we're going to move on to Fiesta at 103, a character with one of the greatest Skylander designs of all time which is what makes this gameplay so goddamn disappointing because you have like this Miriarchy uh, undead warrior with a trumpet and the trumpet is very close range it deals damage at a very low rate his amigos aren't powerful his skull um attack where he becomes nothing but a skull that is that's not powerful neither the attacks don't flow he's not fast paced there is a rhythm to it though you know if you um, tap the primary attack button whilst it's being held then you can create like notes and so overall the music really invests with this character and it makes him really likeable there's just a unique charm to both his design and just the way he maneuvers about um, the musical element of him is all really well captured I just really wish the gameplay was much better because if it was he would seriously escalate up this list but as it stands we have a character with a very strong design very strong like in-game capabilities from an aesthetical standpoint, but we also have a lackluster move set. Sometimes life just isn't fair, <laughs> but moving on to 102, we have Frillipede, a very interesting character. He's got a jacket, but he's a millipede-like character, so he has multiple legs, he can throw grenades in, honing in on enemies no matter which way you're maneuvering, you can log them behind him, to the side of him, and it's so quick, it's so fast-paced, it's powerful too, and they kind of transition smoothly into his jumps like he has chain of attacks but not necessarily chain of different attacks like your primary attacks are always flowing into other primary attacks but then when you want to go into a secondary attack well you never do that for starters because it's a punch which is much slower and not as powerful so why even engage the enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat when being um far away from them is far more effective with this character so there is a lack of balance in this moveset and say his moves don't necessarily flow and he can be a little bit slow paced but the design and the primary attack alone more than make up for it and say even when you're jumping it's not just a primary attack you can lay down like little um mine like things and so there are just so many cool things to this character and so many things they did right with this character especially for cooler contrast he stands out on the shelf for all the right reasons he's got some great texture in so he has a great design, with even greater gameplay he could have been elevated up this list a little bit. But moving on to 101, we have Trap Shadow, just shy of top 100, and this one really hurts, because Trap Shadow has some of the most strategy of any of the Swap Force characters, as well as some of the best colours, they contrast each other nicely, they make the character really pop. I mean, he's Trap, before traps were even a thing, that is so ahead of the time. And say, being able to change the distance of how far you lob your bear trap, uh, pounce in on enemies when you scratch them, and creates a moveset that demands strategy and thoughtful thinking, even if it isn't effective or as powerful as other um, Swap Force movesets. And the bottom half is significantly disappointing like it's just a generic ranged attack for me really he kicks a shadow as he's named shadow <laughs> again i love the design it's so unique for bandana too there's just so much personality driving this figurine and it's creative it's unique there's no other trap master well trap master <laughs> there's no other swapper like it that's for trap and trap shadow speaking to you right there that and also his bear trap almost looks like it could have been traptanium if he was a magic trap master he definitely would have been the best one he's outranked in both 
But say, I just kind of wish that first of all, his scratch, it's a little bit of a generic move, we've mentioned with scratch already that there are attacks that exist in Skarners like this. So we could have done with a better primary secondary move, but say, I love the strategy, I love how it all connects, I love the design, so there's definitely way more positives to this character than otherwise, which is why he gets 101. But we're going to kick off the top 100 with Treadhead. My golly, it hurts to put this guy so low, but once again, he's not really maneuverable, and... Some attacks, enemies need to be behind you, other ones they need to be in front of you. There's no real smooth way to transition between um, defeating enemies with afterburn and defeating them with wheelies. Like, I suppose you can maneuver with wheelie, hit them, turn around, and then hit the afterburner. Um, but all of this is just far too complex to set up, and it's not got really any sort of payoff. Like, normally I'm fine with uh, strategic and more in-depthful type gameplay when it's at least rewarding. This one isn't. Especially since the wheelie is so much more powerful and you don't even need to worry about afterburners after that soldier ability. If you didn't have a soldier ability and you was always worried about burning out, this would be so lame. And the cooldown on that is so long, it does bring us pace into an absolute crawl. And for spin is also a move not really worth using. So overall, he's a character where they definitely had a cool design here, but they had no idea how to implement a good move set into it. It's a move set which is interesting, but it's not effective in combat, it's not as fun as other Skarners, so interesting is really the only thing left for it. But 99 is going to be Ghost Roaster, actually my dad's favourite Skarner ironically, and for me he's not even within the top half. Now I love Ghost Roaster, he's fast paced, I love how in later games he can hit multiple enemies with his um, like Skull Charge, or maybe he's able to do that down for certain Path and Spouse Adventure, I'm not entirely sure, but being able to hit the same enemy with that multiple times whilst you're outmanoeuvring them, he gets incredibly overpowered, okay, the damage is ridiculous, the maneuverability and the fast pacedness of his moveset is ridiculous. Moves don't really flow and I find myself hardly ever using a tertiary attack because it deals damage to you, but hey, on Nightmare Mode in Giants or any other game for that matter, timing it perfectly is so rewarding given that obviously you take no damage from it. So he's a character who can be insane and has some incredible highs, if his moveset flowed together a little bit more he would have been much nicer. But he's still fast-paced, his design is really unique, he's one of the more intimidating and freakish Skanders, so that makes him stand out and makes him more memorable because no other Skanders would dare be as risky with their design as Ghost Roaster is. So overall, he's definitely a character I like, and he's worthy of being 99 on the list right here. Coming in at number 98 is Food Fight, ironically enough a character that Mike Noid has more than 98 versions of, but moving on from all the jokes, Food Fight is... Fine. I mean, for a starter pack character, he does the job quite well. He introduces you to the world of Trapped in Cores by giving you one that doesn't suck and doesn't make it look as though all the other Trapped in Cores would suck, but it also kind of hints at the fact that there are much better cores out there that you should go out and spend your hard-earned money on because that's Skarner's marketing for you. Now, he is a glorified orb, which is obviously um, a pretty simplistic shape, which I've criticised in the past, but this one has a very... um detailed like mold to it the back the fizzles um are really well textured and they're just really great to play around with as a toy he has a tomato gun a zucchini blast it can knock back enemies so when you get close and personal you can easily uh, use your range attacks to finish them off he can even roll around on top of the tomato which is pretty cool and he even has like really great uh, crowd control with his explosive abilities again they aren't really moves that flow into each other besides maybe the zucchini blast and the tomato um gun I love the fact that you leave the little tomatoes behind and you can use those to charge up your shots, make them more powerful. It really encourages you to count up the number of charge shots you have and build up a strategy around that. So, it certainly is a fine moveset, but that's about as far as it goes. Now, 97 is going to be Golden Queen compared to the sensation. Um, she's powerful, not insane. <laughs> so, Golden Queen... Um, her attacks actually flow together very well, and the fact that you can freeze enemies in your gold, um, that giving you the time to create a turret, and then your turret's dealing damage as your main projectiles dealing damage, and your projectiles can interact with your turrets to make them get all buffed up. It's just all of these elements all flow together so that then you can, um, like, easily spawn in one thing, make that thing you spawn even more powerful just by spamming the other thing, so... There's just a lot of time uh, orientated strategy around this character, so for the better you learn that, the more effective she becomes. Uh, unfortunately, projectiles and turrets aren't the most um, inspired movesets, I'm afraid, but I love the detail for her colours, how they pop, and the intricate and body details just makes Golden Queen an excellent figure. And the gameplay certainly is fun, even if it's not the most inspired nor 
um, overpowered of all the senses. But 96 is going to be Whirlwind, a character who combines a unicorn and a dragon. If that isn't cool, I don't know what is. But it's not just a design that's cool. She's really unique in the fact that she's the only Skylander who heals others rather than herself, obviously with her soldier ability, which is cool. It's a shame one of her attacks is wasted with her flight ability. You know, I would have preferred another attack there. But what she has instead are the clouds and rainbows. Now, if you space yourself uh, well enough, you can easily chain your rainbows into the clouds. And not to mention, clouds create um, electricity between them down her best path, the one you should pick. And that stuns enemies. Um, if you get them engulfed in the lightning, they have no chance of escaping it. So she can be incredibly overpowered when used efficient, uh, efficiently even, and that's what makes Whirlwind as good as she is. She is an absolute beast, a force we reckon with. And one hell of an unrated character at that. But moving on, we have Stump Smash at 95, a character who's taken up Lightning McQueen's number apparently. But moving on from the cars references, uh, Stump Smash, he's not a car, you can tell because he's not quick. He has some very unique animations. It's hilarious watching him squirt water out of his uh, mouth when he's swimming uh, in it, obviously. Interesting soul gem, that one. Uh, he's so stupid powerful, it justifies the maleness of this character, even how powerful he is, and sure, he gets hit, he can shrug it off no problem because of how chunky his health bar is, so overall, of all of the Skylanders, he has some of the best balance, his animations are really fun to watch, and they can give you some really great forward momentum, in fact, it's faster to use his, like, running combination than it is to just regularly walk, um, spewing out like a dozen acorns in quick succession with a combination of his acorn path and the series 2 wow power makes him even more over top because most of the time enemies will be defeated by that onslaught of acorns before you even need to get up close and personal with them and trust me as soon as Stump Smash gets up close and personal with an enemy that enemy is finished. Stump Smash is insane, I do think his design is a little basic but he makes up with that with details like his um, nose is a branch with a smaller little branch on it and it makes it look like a wart so he's almost like a trollish um tree hybrid it's so clever for little details they added to his figurine and i love it but we're going to move on to 94 which is jawbreaker yeah another robot character great his main body is just a robot and that would have been really uncool of his design if he was just uh, as generic as that but he has subtanium fists which is really cool and a unique uh, weapon because sure Skarna use their fists all the time but we don't really um, picture like Joptanium the most powerful substance in the world being fists of all things you know you'd think it will be something a lot more insane and yet fists aren't inherently insane but Jawbreaker makes the most of it he definitely goes around breaking jaws so the name is appropriate uh, he has fun personality too his idol animations are really cool um, unfortunately, his pacing is incredibly uneven. One moment you go from Robo Rage mode, which is incredibly quick, to having to wait for, for cooldown after that mode finishes, and then doing the slower punches, less powerful punches. His hypercharged Haymaker, even, is insane, however, and using that Soldier ability on loop, and it's not exactly hard because it charges up really quickly. It's insane how much damage it deals, and it leaves behind an aura of damage as well with the sparks. So, for Soldier, definitely saves this guy. It's what makes him one of the most overpowered trap masters easily. It's just a shame that um, his pacing is really uneven, but otherwise, I like for moveset style. It flows together quite well. You can go from Robo Rage into other attacks, especially his tertiary one, um, with ease. And you actually do the tertiary attack before charging up a hypercharged Haymaker, so it's another layer of overpoweredness. And Jawbreaker's cool. Not as cool! is Countdown at 93, a character which I just have a personal bias towards. I love the fact that he's half robot and half the bomb. It's really uh, creative seeing that, you know, he's a bomb. Bombs count down before they explode. And so the name is so unbelievably appropriate. His little bomb dudes are so cute. It's just a really nicely built up moveset that's definitely overpowered for sure. Do I do wish for moves flow together much more nicely, but having a self-destructive capability is a very high risk, high reward, because you're risking being exposed, but pretty much all of the enemies around you are dealt tons of damage, they're knocked back, so you can recover by the time they even get close to you. Countdown, he's just simply fun is what he is. He doesn't have to do anything extraordinary, he doesn't have to be 
so insanely overpowered. He's just a character that puts a smile on my face whenever I'm playing as him. But 92 is going to be Kingpin, one of the most flowing movesets for them all. He showcases what a brawler should be, as you literally kind of um, sneak around your enemies, you're brawling with them, you're putting them in a loop of melee attacks that they cannot escape out of because you're just combining attacks with um, fluidity and absolute awesomeness, uh, shall I say. Him being a penguin with massive fuck off gauntlets, it's an insane design and I love how it's posed as well, he's kind of like a, he's so battle ready and that makes you want to play as him because he looks like an intimidating force to be reckoned with. So the design is creative, it stands out thanks to the posing and the intimidating look behind him and the save, the moves that definitely flows together quite well, he's fast paced. He's not nearly as powerful as other senseis though, and say so there can be moments where um you're completely drawn out of his gameplay by moves like his ice shield that just don't feel like they flow for us to move it all that well and when you have a move set that flows together so well and then all of a sudden you have a move that doesn't fit and slows down the piece of the character it's so distracting and off-putting for the entirety of his quality i should say but 91 is going to be astro blast a character that you really have to upgrade because out of the box this guy is hot garbage but i love his design he's got this spacesuit with spikes on it he even does like um a lower gravity walking speed for his animations which is awesome you gotta combine his attacks you know you can't just mash attacks and that's what makes his gameplay more in depth and cooler than others and obviously his moves flow because of it i love how he can um create a flick kick knock back enemies and then charge it up for the sake of a meteor if those two moves flow together and say after you've knocked back an enemy you can laser them up or you can create a space rock and a disco ball so he even has moonwalking animations which is appropriate for a space guy because moonwalking and all that everything goes into making this guy feel kind of uniform everything belongs and it's a blast to say the least it's just such a shame that he doesn't have a strong start and you need to upgrade him before he becomes any good and the fact that he's also not as powerful as other superchargers at least not in my personal experience of him i could be incredibly wrong i am bad at video game after all let's say astro blast is a character to where i feel like his designs and his animations and all that in game far away the actual gameplay part but we're going to move on to number 90 which is free ranger who's the complete opposite his animation is fine very uh, chicken like so it does build up a character but his design is just okay i mean he's a lightning chicken what do you think you get when you combine lightning and chicken the most generic form that free ranger could have looked for the sake of his figurine I love how his attacks kind of chain though you can obviously stun enemies with projectile but you can't just use projectile because it's so not as powerful as the melee attack so you have to go in with melee attacks it's encouraged because of how much more powerful it is and then that combines well with his tornado because he can spin enemies disorientate them and the maneuverability you have that they don't is a massive advantage so free range can be incredibly overpowering i just wish his designs and animations were a little bit better and then he could have obviously elevated himself up the list a bit more and say the projectile isn't good um if you don't pick the correct path for it so the fact that um, you know, that projectile attack can be disappointing and out of place and doesn't work as well with the other attacks as you would have liked unless you pick the correct path. That's just, again, a little bit of a letdown, really. And he's not fast-paced either. Like, uh, his tornado does not launch him forwards. It's good at spinning enemies around, but not giving you good momentum, so... It's not fast paced, shall I say. For 89, we've gotten to a character that even my laptop is really excited about, so you know you can hear its fans running in the background, but we're talking about none other than Smith Boom, as we've nicknamed him, because even Luke is good with this character, and that's when you know a character is good, when even someone like Luke can be annihilated with them. Now, it's not just for meme in his uh, nickname that gives me such joy behind this character, but it's just the fact that it's something I can personally connect to because, you know, he's a fun guy. I like fun guy and uh, terrible puns, clearly. I mean, we started this entire ordeal with Smith Boom, for Pete's sake. So, naturally, he's a character that really pops on the shelf as well. He's got a lot of contrast and colours. He has a slingshot, which is a really unique and creative weapon. And he even slings himself out of it. So, that's a fucking awesome soldier ability if I ever have seen one. Um, his, obviously... Little mushrooms ricochet off walls and it makes him really effective in combat because he can knock back enemies and uh, create distance with his mushroom shield that transitions nicely into being able to bury underground and make it explode and then he can bop back up, go back into projectile game and uh, explosive 
mushroom volley shots. Either way you spin it, this character is really effective in combat, his moves kind of flow together, and there is some pace behind the character, but the main fun things about him are not only the puns and the sharp contrast and colours, but also the sound effects. I mean, they are hilarious listening to literal mushrooms being slung. They sound exactly as they should, and it's so overly cartoony, it makes it brilliant. But moving on, we have Night Shift at number 88, a character who would no doubt be better if he had a better primary and tertiary move. I love his secondary attack though, and it's basically for shift bottom half, which is the only thing saver in this swap force combination for me, because the shift bottom half can slow down enemies, outmaneuver enemies, so you never get hit. No wonder why Knight's uh, health is so low. And um, then obviously it has the extra lives. The only problem with Knight himself having such a low health bar is that when you combine him with other bottom halves, he becomes a pretty garbage combination. But the shift bottom half is pretty much the best uh, combination to combine with any of the top halves out there. So that, my friends, is what makes Knight Shift as good as he is. Not Knight, but Shift. Now for 87, I have Funny Bone. Now this is where we get to start talking about Scandalous. I love because Funny Bone, he is adorable. He has really cutesy animations that are very well thought through and uh, just really well detailed. As is his figurine, he has little chips and black spots um, of his bones, obviously, where they'd all connect and where there's battle damage. And he just looks up with so much cuteness. There's a lot of personality pumped into his figurine. The tail is really cool, it almost looks like Traptanium and coming from a core that's pretty unique and nice to see. But overall, his moves just flow in combat, he's fast paced, and what really immerses you in the character is that how can you not l love such an adorable little undead puppy dog? 86 without further ado is Hothead, a very easy um, choice for 86 given how good he is, because first of all I love the detail, the contrast between the red and the uh, oranges for the lava and the rock. With Eruptor it works, or same as Eruptor I should say, but this character has a lot more detail to him, his shape's a little bit more disproportionate, especially since his lower half is so much more smaller than his buffed up top half, and it's a really creative blend of oil and fire to obviously create like flamethrower type attacks he's just a really huge powerhouse and it really justifies uh, being of a powerhouse notion given that you can't just spam attacks you need to combine them so you're rewarded for strategy and everything so overall hothead is just a giant with a fun figurine and an even more funner moveset Although, when compared to other characters, first of all, this soul gem is hard to activate past giants given the control scheme for it, and the fact that he doesn't wind up being all the more maneuverable, in fact, it actually harms his maneuverability and he can be pretty uh, slow paced to say the least due to slow attacks and the fact that there is no way to really speed up his maneuverability in a reliable way because the motorcycle doesn't do any of that for him. Now, 85 is Stealth Wolf, a really fast-paced character, and that's easily the most fun thing about her, and the fact that she's so annihilative in combat. How much damage she deals and how quickly she deals it makes her incredibly fast-paced. And her design is pretty decent. I mean, she's a ninja elf, so it's very fantasy-inspired design. And I quite like it, personally, but she is a little bit of a... Uh, too easy character to master so to say there's no time and investment in this character you just mash buttons and kind of win even her stealth abilities are kind of easy to come to grasps with so the simpleness in her moveset is really the only thing letting her down and i still quite like stealth off which is why she's 85 but halfway through at 84 the exact halfway marker is being given to boom bloom a character whose figurine is a little bit blocky when it comes to the colors she has a little bit too much green and red they don't sharply contrast each other enough for my likings and for posing is okay it's not as personality uh, driven as other sensei characters but i love the texture in for vine whip really does uh, feel like it could damage some enemies and it makes it so she's a character you want to pick up and play and as soon as you start playing as a you see why her moves flow so organically and they really stack up in damage she's not the most effective sensei in terms of damage output but she certainly is one of the most fun characters to stack up damage with She's a little slow paced in her movement speed and it's a shame that she has such slow movement compared to how fast her combat goes because of how engaged you are when playing as her. So there is a little bit of a pacing issue there, outside of combat I should say, but I still quite enjoy Boom Boom's moveset, it's just not as good as other um, senseis by sheer comparison alone, but as a standalone character, Boom Bloom is fantastic. Now, 83 is going to be trigger happy. This is going to turn a lot of heads. A lot of people have no doubt already wrote some angry comments at me for daring to put trigger happy at 83. 
Well, he's in the top half, he's already beaten out more characters than he's lost to, and there's no shame in that. Trigger Happy just doesn't really have an exciting shape for his design, though I love uh, his personality brought to life in the games, his figurine just doesn't really present that for me. The closest we get to it is his tongue hanging out, I guess. So they could have done more to express his personality, and he could have had a more interesting shape to him as well, but his gameplay is so addictive. Um, you're actually encouraged to use the gold safe as well, especially when you use a coin flip and path because it's so much more powerful. Um, but the bullets work very nicely as well, being able to ricochet them or charge them up and deal increased damage. It's a little ounce of strategy, even though in the end all you wind up doing is button mashing. And at the end of the day, button mashing like crazy to parallel the very same hectic personality style of the chaotic trick happy. It just immerses you more in the character himself, and he's just a fun character because button mashing is fun. It really is as simple as that. I just kind of wish there was a little more complexity to his uh, design and his moveset could have done with a little bit more uh, renovation and complexity as well, but it's still a character that I love. I cannot emphasize this enough. Now moving on to 83, we have Tree Rex, or Eddie 2 even. He's a fun starter pack character. His moves combine together quite well for a large damage output. You can transition from a charge into an elbow quite easily, but that's a pathway upgrade and the uh, cannon can be quite janky in later games, not necessarily accurate, and when you have to charge it up and not get accuracy on it, it's very disappointing. So there definitely are stuff about Trirex's moveset that really take you out of the immersion and frustrate you, but overall he's still a powerhouse, he's still fun, he can be fast paced, and that charge really does allow him to get into combat, get you engaged, never really let go of that, so... He's a character I enjoy, he's just flawed, and I wish he was more than just a tree, but he's a giant tree, and he has lots of texturing and details to make his figurine fun. Uh, there could have been just a little more complexity to his design, even though there are creative elements like for moss uh, underwear, for example. That's, uh, that's hilarious, but say, a tree is still a tree at the end of the day, and we have too many of those to count on the Skarnas franchise. Now, 81 goes to Dr. Neo Cortex, a character to where if you combine his attacks, it becomes an absolute powerhouse. Though his moveset is a little bit more dull than other sensei, he's not nearly as fun, it's encouraged for you to stay back, and so, for lack of engagement and intimidation you have facing enemies up close and personal, it's just not a character that you feel like gives you an intense experience, or an immersion, immersion experience even. You just feel a little too overpowered, which can be fun, and say, having the iconic uh, Dr. Nero Cortex and his personality adapted and his uh, moveset adapted into the Skarna scene to make him fit well is certainly creative and perfect in execution. I just kind of wish for a little bit more engagement-wise and the fact that we could have had a more fast-paced character out of this, but we didn't get that. Now, AD is going to be Zulu, an incredibly underrated character. This just goes to show you that we're already having the top tiers flooding in because this is easily B tier and above we're looking at. So, yeah, there definitely is no shame in Skanda's scoring as um, high as 80 over here, and Zulu is no exception as his details, uh, for detail on his figurine even, is outstanding. You can look at his staff and see like bird, wolf, and boar icons, which are obviously for creatures he summons using his staff. Uh, he, he, he even has a boar belt buckle. And between the cape and the armor, he does have enough of a color contrast and definitely enough texture in to make for a good toy. But his in-game counterpart is truly very shy, so he can have a wolf active whilst he's on the back of the boar and fire enough birds. So he has a projectile, he has a honing in wolf attack that can uh, destroy enemies from afar and dig up food for you. But on top of that, the boar can also, whenever enemies get close, knock them back. Though unfortunately, Zulu... Can't really deal with enemies that are behind him unless the wolf hones in on them, which could be just damn luck. For the most part, his birds only really focus on what's in front of him, so the lack of crowd control is really the only flaw I have for this character. And moving on to 79, we have Wallop, aka the equivalent of Melee Drobot. Now, this guy's damage output is insane. I also kind of like his design, even though his colors are really blocky and they don't really contrast, so therefore he doesn't stand out on the shelf, unlike other Earth characters with nice, sharp contrasting colors and nice details to them. He does have a nice shape, though, overly cartoony, again, with the bulky shoulders in particular. But what really is uninspired about this guy is the moveset, because it's hammers, hammers, and more hammers. He has no earth-based attacks. They just gave him two hammers, made all of his attacks revolve around said hammers, and just called it a day. 
yeah, the moveset is rather lame. They could have done so much more than just hammers, but that's all what we get. And because of how uninspired the moveset is, and the fact that I don't find him any more than a one-trick pony, all you do is hold for primary attack button and win, it does get dull and a bit of a repetitive gameplay loop for me. So I do love him being melee Drew, but the fact that you can just absolutely rip Golden Queen's turrets to shreds, he's fun. Just um, not exactly an inspiring character, shall we say, when it comes to the creativity poured into his moveset, or lack thereof. Now for 78, I have Flitzicle, the best dark in my personal opinion, so it's clear to me that um, the dark scanners aren't all the greatest. Now, Flitzicle is a fast-paced character with moves that really flow, but unfortunately his soul gem really brings you out of the fight because you have to wait through animations and an attack that doesn't feel like it's worth all of the cooldown and vulnerability. So... Pacing can be abruptly brought to a crawl, and that makes things overall less balanced. Uh, the detail on this figurine though is spectacular, I love the scythe, his clothing, it's a really intimidating presence. And to say it's definitely reflecting the gameplay for the most part, his attacks do flow and they are very powerful and speedy. But there are just certain ones that really draw you out and slow down the pace and, and just create for a character that's not nearly as good as other senseis by comparison or other scanners by comparison. Like, for example, Spitfire coming in at 77. The perfect starter pack character because he has melee combinations that are very well animated and fast paced. He can dash around the uh, scene with absolute speed and awesomeness. He is such a fast-paced and fun character. It's a shame he's rather basic, but his moveset, not his moveset, his design even, is unique, especially his shape. You know, he doesn't have legs per se, and he consists of all sorts of different vehicle parts. It's definitely a theme design and perfect for superchargers, hence why he got that starter pack placement. And to say, I love the animations for his combinations, and they are fun to pull off, but they can get a little basic and tiresome after a while. So whilst I love being able to dash around the screen and have that fast paceness, it does get stale. Um, those constant reliance on melee attacks and fire tornadoes after a while, and by comparison, once again, Spitfire just isn't as strong as characters like Boomer coming in at 76, who's easily one of the best Skylanders right off the get-go. He, he's an absolute powerhouse, and his figuring is also really clever because his clothing is all from his beard. So his beard is long and glorious, it's uh, cleverly done, obviously has dynamite, and you can see the craziness in his eyes, his pupils, it's a very personality driven um, character, he has his gauntlets too on his fists and his uh, feet, and you can train his attacks together quite well, you can create just traps with your um, troll bombs as you retreat from enemies, they just walk straight into them, or you can um, create a circle of them and then as you circle back around again you kick them towards enemies. Uh, dynamite works well, his pound is a little bit of a waste of attack, so why would you use the secondary attack when you have a far superior primary and tertiary option, so that attack going to waste is kind of harm for figuring on an overall scale for me, but that doesn't take away from how much I like his design and how strong he is right from the get-go and upgrading that only adds further to that. Now for 75 exactly we have Freeze Blade. It's almost an insult that a character as good as this is 75. That just goes to show you how many Skarners there are that I truly, truly love. Freeze Blade is one of them. I love his design, though um, I must admit ice attacks, especially turning people into ice prisons, feels a little bit too similar to Prison Break, though this time it's a more easily aimed projectile, so it's kind of like Prison Break, but made even easier. So for risk and reward there, it's kind of gone, uh, and you also just kind of use primary attacks, like you use them, you're dealing so much damage, and it's satisfying, but you don't necessarily feel as though you're being rewarded for your gameplay, it's just kind of like something that comes along with the price tag of the figurine, so in other words there's no real uh, special reward to your gameplay, it just kind of happens and you deal with it and you're happy but you wish there was more to it. It's, it's a hard thing to explain, but point here is that it's hard to explain what is missing about Freeze Blade. Uh, overall, he's great, just not as great when compared to others, like for example Ember, at 74, a character whose moveset blows together 
so organically. She's so fast paced as her combinations are not only overpowering, but they reward you for chaining together attacks in unique ways. For characters, gameplay is constantly feeling fresh because you're tackling combat scenarios differently every single time you play as her. Not to mention she's a fire samurai with a dual bladed fire sword thing that Bob. It is an awesome design, a moveset that, you know, exemplifies the awesomeness of the design, I suppose you could go as far to say. She's a character who flows, so she's very slow paced out of combat, so she has the same problems there as Boom Bloom does. And she can be very ineffective in combat, like say, her moves flow and she's fast paced, but she's not as stacked in the damage category as other senseis, like she takes a while to stack damage unfortunately, and she can struggle with maneuverability too, especially agility, like she can't um, switch between targeting a single Skarn or enemy even, and then switching that round for someone behind you, the best thing to do is probably do a jumping attack and then run away and let the fire engulf them, so the lack of agility certainly hurts her, but at 73 we have Fling Kong, again a character whose maneuverability is probably his biggest undoing, and the fact that when compared to other Skarn, he's just not nearly as memorable, he came out later in the Trap Team lineup, and as a core to which he was already overshadowed by Trap Masters, he just isn't most memorable to me, and say, you cannot easily, um, like, switch to traveling directly behind you, like, the 180 degree agility of this character is hot garbage, luckily you don't need it for the most part, because this frisbee is just kind of ricochet, or you can charge one in order to launch one up, and it will fall down on enemies, or hone in, it's similar to Hex's Skull Rain, but done in even more quicker succession to even more power, so obviously that makes Fun King... Fling King, Fling Kong Superior already, you can tell that my names I get him mixed up because he's so unmemorable, which is a shame because his design is actually awesome, yes it's a little derivative of Aladdin in and of itself, but a monkey atop a flying carpet is very unique from a Skarda standpoint, and his colours really contrast and his pose is really cool to make him stand out on the shelf, you look at that toy and you're like, whoa that's cool, but after you've played as him for 5 minutes, you kind of forget that you've played as him for 5 minutes, because even his moveset, isn't the most original, like you dash with your carpet and that flows well into the rest of his attacks and he's fun, he's effective in combat, but he's not memorable and that's his main flaw. Now 72 is going to be Dinorang, what a powerhouse this is indeed, enemies get close to you and they have to deal with Earth Fists, or you know, they're dealing with Earth Fists at the same time as your twin boomerangs and you can even use your regular boomerangs for the sake of dealing uh, massive projectile damage, it's easy to see why this character is so beloved, I mean he's a freaking Stegosaurus. Boomerangs of Pete's sake, that is an awesome design, he is like one of the best dragons from Spice Adventure period, being that he he is the Earth Dragon, but enough of those jokes, say, so stacking up damage for this character is just so easy and so satisfying, you love the design, there's some sharp contrasting colours like the green and then the red spines he has, the yellow boomerangs, it all makes a sharp contrast that really stands out on the shelf and he's so much fun. It's just a shame that he's not as good as other Skarnas, because when I compare him to characters like Gilgrunt, he's not nearly as iconic. Like, sure, he got an Elite that returned in later games, but even Elites kind of went over people's heads more so than Reposers did, and Gilgrunt got so many of those that his iconicness really elevates him up on this list alone. But why did he become iconic in the first place? Because he's cool. I mean, he's a fish with a harpoon gun, and that harpoon gun deals dumb stupid damage as well, so being able to deal damage from a distance and also push back enemies whenever they get close, it makes it so much more easier to annihilate foes in front of you, and Gilgrunt is such a satisfactory character to play as, um, he's fast paced too, especially since you can um, use your jetpack and that increases your maneuverability on the battlefield, though you can only really fight things in front of you in that form, so it's a risk and reward type dealio, which again, as to how much fun this character is, it's so easy to see why he's a massive fan favourite. But number 70 for me is going to be Bouncer, one of the fan favourite giants. Uh, it's easy to see why he's got the same uh, button mashing satisfaction as what Trick Happy possesses, but he can also even it out with his eye lasers and his rockets uh, that give you high risk, high world type situations because obviously you can target with those rockets but also leave yourself incredibly vulnerable. Uh, he's also the giant with the most maneuverability and most speed, so he has the best, most balanced pacing of any giant besides um, Swarm, who's yet to pop up. And his design is just cool. I mean, he has little finger guns that um, are presented in a really playful manner to bring about his personality. The yellows and the reds of his uh, 
colour palette and of itself are contrasting and really make the character stand out. So overall, he's a cartoony character with ridiculous proportions, but it makes him fun as a giant to play as and a fun toy to play around with, and one that stands out on the shelf thanks to that said colour contrast. But the funny number belongs to Pit Boss, a character who is insanely overpowered. Of all of the sorcerers from Imaginators Sensei-wise, he is probably the best. I believe he outranked uh, Mr. Cat, Dr. Neocortex for some reason is a sorcerer, and Golden Queen. So yeah, Pit Boss is the best sorcerer in Imaginators, and it's easy to see why. Um, you can literally engulf enemies in your snake, and then you knock them back directly afterwards with explosions, and you create even more snakes, like it's a snake whose moveset is entirely based around snakes, and yes, it's not the most original thing we've seen, but um, we don't actually see you know, his legs, uh, instead it's dressed up in a really interesting armor that's nicely textured. And to say, I just love how his gameplay flows, you can create pools of snakes, you can power those up with your other projectiles, so every attack leans into another, like I say, when you use your secondary ability to create just like a chain snake and enemies get trapped within it, and then you can knock them back and use your projectiles to hone in on them. It's a very narrative overtop moveset that's fast paced and keeps you invested in the game because you have to chain those attacks together in order to be effective in the first place. And say, uh, even being a snake they was able to come up with new ideas and concepts to make this uh, concept fresh and more importantly, fun in game. But 68 is going to go to Punk Shop, a character who's a little uh, derivative of Zap unfortunately because she does create uh, water puddles and then she electrifies them, but for tertiary attack uh, it's great for crowd control, it deals damage all around you and stuns enemies, so uh, the strategy here is that you can easily um, outmaneuver them and get out of precarious situations, and that makes her really super broken, she's so underrated because she is so good, her projectiles deal stupid damage, um, all of her other attacks deal with them super damage and everything links back together, her water puddles can be uh, electrified by either her tertiary or her primary, her primary can be charged up and it's high risk but it rewards you pretty well with a fast onslaught of projectiles, it's much more better than um, doing bugs because she fires them all around, you can aim them uh, much more easily, it deals better damage. So why play as Doombug when you have much superior characters by comparison, which is why Punk Shock is much higher. But coming in at 67, Eyebrawl has won out over 100 other Skylanders. That is nothing to scoff at. So Eyebrawl fans, I think you should be pleased about that at the bare minimum. And I still have high praise for this character because at the end of the day, when they confirmed one giant per element, easily for giant, I was most curious about was, ooh, what will they do with an undead element, I wonder? And they gave you a massive suit of armor with a great attention to detail and a massive eyeball on top of it all. Either piece of the character of which has its own personality to it and there's its own risk and reward because do you bring out the faster eyeball and give an onslaught or deliver an onslaught of damage with your projectile attacks or do you uh, hang back and make sure your bulky armor isn't really uh, being dealt damage to. Um, for theming of this character all of his attacks are eyeball themed and it's really creative. I do wish his primary attack had something to do more than just with punches, like punches are the only lane part of his moveset I reckon and even this combination all he does is slam down both fists which is something we've seen before and it's not even a particularly well animated combo either he just jumps up and slams his fist down there isn't that much originality to it and there isn't that much actual movement to the character unfortunately he is slow paced I will admit but that is where my flaws for, for the character begin and end I love the detail in the armor it's a well made design and the gameplay is fun keeps you on your toes now moving on to 66 we have smash hit a character whose maneuverability in the battlefield is not something to be underestimated because you can maneuver with a primary ability so easily and because of the fact that you're swinging your wrecking ball all the way around you um, means that you're dealing with crowds with ease you can also slam it down you can leave your wrecking ball in place so it's dealing damage to enemies in place and then um, you can bring it back to you, creating a huge slam, which again is great for crowd control. And the whip is faster, but less in damage than the Wrecking Ball. So there's a constant, um, fast-paced investment to his gameplay that improves the game in of itself. Because you're more immersed in the world of superchargers. Uh, his strategy is nothing to be 
underestimated because if you go into things with no strategy, first of all, you will not be effective, and second of all, because you can tackle each combat scenario differently, with the fact that there's so many different ways you can play this character, it means you're constantly having fresh new experiences, and he's a powerhouse, that always helps. He's a marsupial with a freaking wrecking ball that's bigger than his face, it's an awesome design, I have no idea why Smash It ranked so low in my original ranking list, he's really fucking good! For 65, I have Batspin, a very underrated character, a bit like the rest of the Trap Team cores, really. And to say, I really like her design, the colours do get a little blocky, so there isn't a very sharp colour contrast to her, so her figurine doesn't necessarily stand out. And the posing is a little fragile as well, and not too personality driven. So it's between like the figurine the design and the name, which makes her the most forgettable of the free to characters, and not the one that sends out the most, but... Based on her gameplay alone, she is easily best of the three, as she can create just an army of bats, and the more bats you summon with your primary attack, the more you can create in the tornado. Um, and then, obviously, she can create a great ball of bats from her soul gem, and she can turn into a bat as well, so she has a lot of different moves you can use, a lot of different strategies she possesses. So ultimately, the strategy pays off each way, each time in different ways even, and so her gameplay is constantly fresh because every single time you tackle combat, you tackle it differently, and that is so cool. But for 64, I have tried it. A character who is a little more boring and uninspired than other senseis when it comes to his moveset. I mean, all he does is pound his mace and he even swings it like a baseball bat, which is cool. That has a nice sound effect and great knockback. Uh, so yeah, for moves aren't anything to write home about, but for sheer power behind the moves and the way how it demonstrates that power, you have slow build-up, very loud and strong sounding, well, sound effects. Uh, you really are presented with so much power behind this Smasher character. You feel powerful, and that makes him incredibly satisfying to play as. Not to mention, he's a massive Triceratops who has an awesome figurine, an awesome design, a great attention to detail, and so you just feel such sheer power playing as this guy, and that makes him fun. But the 63, I have high fault. His moves flow together really well. He's pretty fast-paced, and his animations are really crisp and clean-looking. I also love the attention to detail on his figurine. There is scratches and battle damage, but overall, he just looks like a, an advocate for justice and all that. So he does a really great job demonstrating personality through the details of his figurines and his moveset. Like I say, it flows together, and it's a fast-paced moveset. It's just not as efficient and powerful as other superchargers, I find. And he can be a little more slower in the actual attacks themselves, even if they do flow and they can be pretty fun and, like I say, well animated. So the character certainly um, has his minor flaws, but other than that, I thoroughly enjoy him. Similar to 62, which is Bushwhack, a character with a fine amount of detail, a massive axe, which is so much fun to helm. Especially given that you can use his soul gem to literally grow up a tree. Very life-inspired attack, very appropriate for his element, but then he chops it down, and the irony there of a life scander, a scander that should preserve and honour nature, is now cutting it down. It's so creative and it's really powerful too, very high risk, high reward because you're quite vulnerable when you use it, but when the tree falls down it pretty much annihilates everything on screen. Uh, it's not just a soldier which is great, all of his other attacks work pretty well, his headbook has great knockback, his uh, acorns do great stun damage and have great uh, distance, and then his axe obviously has some of the most characterising combination animations of any Skander, I love his combos. But it's also really powerful, his axe, they leave behind thorns, which can, you know, stack up damage over time. Very useful for boss fights, in fact, Bushwhack is just a beast boss fights, period, given that he's a trap master. So overall, this character is just so much fun, he's presented with so much personality, I love his um, animations for his combos. The only problem I have is that his moveset doesn't necessarily flow together, you just kind of go from one attack to the other, but all the other attacks kind of allow you to take advantage of other attacks, so you can knock back enemies, create an acorn to stun them, and then single them out with an axe. So there's certainly a strategy still, even if it's a lot more simple than other Skanders, which is why 62 is a perfect spot for him. But 61 is going to be Dr. Crankcase, yet another character that you can't just mash a power attack button and win with. You can certainly hold it and win, because his soldier ability is very good. But I like how he has to combine attacks, I like how he has his little hat minions, they're cute and really uh, characterised, it makes Dr. Crankcase just... A force to be reckoned with, really. The attention to detail in this figurine is also spectacular. There's some really sharp and nice contrasting colours there that pop and really help the figurine stand out. So, overall, 
Yeah, he's a little too similar to Spy Rise from the design department, but that's where my flaws begin in Emphis character because his gameplay is fleshed out and about as perfect as the Sensei gets. Now, for number 60, I have Chill, yet another very underrated scanner. Uh, she doesn't really have much of a personality to speak of, but I love her design and the fact that her armor is incredibly detailed and it has a nice color contrast that stands out on the shelf and makes for a perfect legendary form, might I add. And say, she does present herself as quite heroic, the figurine in of itself has a very personality driven um, like mold into it, for posing, just like I say, it looks heroic. And her gameplay flows together quite well, you can go from shield bashing like ice prisons to show, uh, throwing javelins through them quite easily, so you can create up to 5 javelins at once which gets insanely overpowered. Like sure you're mashing primary attacks a lot, but down the correct paths you cannot just do that, you have to also use her ice prisons and down the other path, uh, each path is balanced as the other path can freeze those enemies and make it easy to single out upon them. Her narwhal can be charged quite well and easily, uh, it does leave you vulnerable though, so it's high risk and high reward, uh, one of my favourite type of moves. So Chill just overall is a character that receives so much more hate than she deserves because her moves are a lot better than people let on and they can really overwhelm enemies at time. But at number 59 is Deja Vu, I love this design, the colours contrast each other and pop, she really stands out on the shelf. And she's a great representation of French culture, not only in the name alone, but also those colours I talked to you about previously. They just feel very French inspired. She even has like a time hourglass to her, which is utilised in the moveset itself, which is very cleverly built up and demand strategy because you can't just bring out clones at any time. You can get hit if you're not stupid with them, but they double up for damage. And then you can create black holes and flow back into projectiles with ease. And then your clone, well, if it's hit, it heals you up. But it also expires with a big bang, just like the black holes do. Just all of these moves come together to stack up damage with such ease. Her only flaw is really how low her health bar is. But when she can annihilate enemies to this extent from as far away as she is, it goes to show how much of a powerhouse Deja Vu truly can be. And for that, I love this character and I love the uh, figurine itself. There's just so much unrated about this character, so she definitely deserves to be 59. Man, we are getting into some amazing characters here, and Snapshot of 58 is no exception. He is the perfect core and the fact that he has a bow and arrow, but it's not just a bow and arrow, it's a bow and sword arrow, so... His Traptanium can be used for multiple attacks, it's great. His uh, weakness here is a tertiary attack because you're vulnerable and it's not nearly as powerful so you don't find yourself ever using it and I suppose the attacks don't really flow as much as you'd want to but they do flow into the jumping ability very nice. Uh, I love his jumping ability, it's got great agility to it too. It means you can easily um, turn yourself around and attack enemies and it gives you knockback as well. So there are plenty of tools to take advantage of with Snapshot. He's a powerhouse, you can uses uh, charged projectiles with ease because they're so quick and easy to power up. And say, going from his um, arrow attacks to his sword attacks is so easy that it makes it so... Of all the starter pack characters, this is the one that you feel the most motivated to upgrade and power up because he starts good and he continues to be good throughout his uh, upgrade chamber. And just having a crocodile with a bone arrow is a sick design, so it's certainly creative as well. But moving on to 57, we have Double Dare Trick Happy. I prefer this one over the original just because the moves outside of the guns are a little more creative and his design brings about a lot more personality. Uh, there's a lot more complex shapes at work, but also just giving him a coat and a ring of fire around his guns just makes him look like more of a showman. And so that concept behind the revamp of his design is really cool. I've really invested in this character and I thoroughly enjoy playing as him and his moveset being more intricate. Just gives you more to do when you're not just mashing buttons. And he still has a mashing button, so there's still that iconic fun behind Trick Happy. Yeah, this is one of a few superchargers that actually revamp the original. But moving into 56, which gets to kick off the top third of ranking list, we have Torch. This character gets so insane. Her soul gem allows for you to create blue fire, which burns hotter than regular fire, so the science is there. And the fact that you can deal a constant rate of like 250 damage is ridiculous coming from a core standard. She can whip her hair around, which is great for crowd control, and it knocks back all enemies in your way. Uh, for Horseshoe, kind of equips itself to enemies and deals uh, damage over time. So her tools 
they are perfect for every single different situation so you use them differently you're never encouraged to use only one and so her moveset has balance it's uh, fun tackling each scenarios in different manners and just having that sheer amount of power behind her is incredible plus Skarners is a fantasy game and fantasy like films and games are often set in medieval times Skarners isn't but Torch really would fit in that timeline given that she's a blacksmith so seeing a blacksmith in Skarners one that is as powerful as this is just insanely cool but 55 is going to be for Sensei Chaos because he combines all of the different battle classes for a creative and fun moveset that's also overpowered. So Chaos is everything you look for in Sensei. Unfortunately, the figurine isn't great. I like the texturing, but overall there's just a lack of sharp contrast and colors. And, Sen uh, and Chaos is just a character who works better as a disproportioned, funny cartoon villain as he does an actual physical figurine. Though they definitely bring about his personality with said figurine. So say... Figurine I'm not the largest fan of, but everything else when it comes to his gameplay, you know, his projectiles, his melee attacks, they flow together quite well, they're very well animated, I love that he summons Doomlanders too, fighting Doomlanders as Chaos is just a really nice touch, and so there are things about this character that I thoroughly enjoy, uh, I do find that his moves can be a little slow paced at points and they don't necessarily flow as well as you'd want them to, even though they are uh, very effective in combat and can deal a lot of damage very quickly. Uh, he's not so great with enemies behind him however, his agility has something to be desired. So like all characters uh, at this high up in the list, he has really high highs but also just those few minor issues that put him down the list for me. Uh, issues like with wind ups, primary attack, you mash it too hard and in the later games it will automatically charge and it's not as effective. Um, charging his fist as it is mashing his primary attack button but he can still stack up damage and it's ridiculous the way how he toys with his enemies it's uh, also ironic because he's a toy who's a literal wind up toy like it's so creative what they put into this uh, design because it has sharp contrast and colors he's cute so you want to pick up and play as him but just the idea of a wind up toy being a toy in our real world but then also a wind up toy in his world it's such a cool concept, and say so you can use springs to launch up enemies, and then your fists, when you mash them, can keep them in the air so they have no chance of attacking you. Or you can draw on enemies uh, by creating your wind-up abilities, power yourself up, and then launch them back again with knockback and go back into brawling with them. You're always facing them, so you don't need to worry about agility. It's so easy to single out enemies, uh, even running allows you to build up your gauge and it makes him so fast paced, his moves organically flow, this character is just insanely fun really, he's fun, fast paced, his design is beyond clever, he's just not as good when compared to other Skarders like for example Spy Rise, man, it physically, it physically hurts me to put Spy Rise at this point on the list. There are just so many Skarners that I love to the same capacity as Spy Rise that I have to put them here. But for those of you who think 53 is a disgrace, all of these characters are so compact and so close to each other that 53 is basically the same as putting him at 25. I wish I could put all of these Skarners in the top 25, but unfortunately, that's not how ranking videos work. Now, Spy Rise, the only flaw I have with him is um, the fact that his bottom half doesn't flow into the rest of his attacks very well, but that's the same with most swappers, really. It's a flaw that carries over. And say his bottom half just isn't nearly as powerful as his top half because his, part, his, his top half is a unit. You can scan enemies with a really powerful laser and then you can finish them off and heal yourself in the process. It is such an insult to injury to those enemies knowing that they are being absolutely annihilated and that Spy Rise has been incredibly rewarded for such easy um, maneuvering kills. He has a cocoon ability which is somewhat uh, risky because you can be left vulnerable but it defeats enemies so quickly that ultimately you aren't left vulnerable for very long. Now 52 is going to be Bash. Uh, Crash Disguise is not going to be happy me putting his favourite character at 52. But again, these characters are so compact and close to one another. What I love about Fa uh, Bash, I almost said Fash for a moment there, um, but Bash is wow pal flows into the rest of his moves really well. You can be rolling, you can knock back enemies with that, and then all of a sudden when you roll into a crowd, you can create that wow pal, knock back everything around you, deal really super damage, and then projectiles are fired off at enemies too, because that's the thing, like, Bash has everything you need. He has abilities that speed him up, he has really powerful primary attack, and he has a projectile with his tertiary. So, if you're ever looking for variation 
in a Skarner as well as a character who can tank damage. Bash is perfect for that. His playstyle is perfect for people like Crush for Skylands who want to have a bit of everything thrown into their Skarner. Sure, the variety can get a little overwhelming at times, and you do kind of wish that there was a little bit more of a theme to this character because he's not consistent. It kind of feels as though they're trying to make three different characters in one here. Also, he's a rock dragon. He's not the most creative dragon from Spice Event Shift, though it is refreshing to see a dragon without a flight ability and without wings, period. So, you know, there's two sides of that coin. But Bash is a character that, whilst I love him, I can't bring myself to bring him above 52. Now, 51 is the best giant. So what does that show you about everything above it, that they're better than all eight of the giants? Swarm of all the giants has the most maneuverability, and therefore he becomes the most fast-paced, and he's an absolute powerhouse too. His animations are crisp, and they look really clean. I love how he swashbuckles his enemies. He's a perfect swashbuckler. And say, so, just the maneuverability makes him fast-paced, and he's by far the most fun giant in my experiences of him. My only problem is that the design is a little basic, and it's not nearly as exciting as other giants. Like, you don't place swarm onto portal and have that same excitement when you first play as him after you upgrade him you realize how good he is and you kind of get over it but still swarm's design could have been a lot better now kicking off our top 50 it's going to be lava lance eruptor easily one of the biggest improvements from the original to the supercharged revamp because his moves flow together so well with such fast paceness and such a sheer amount of power once again his animations are crisp and really clean looking but he's just really effective in combat. He deals a lot of damage very quickly. Um, but no amount of changing up his design is going to stop the fact that he's a glorified orb. Like, all what they did is they gave him a awesome, like, spiked helmet and a lance. He's, his shape still isn't anything to write home about. But I just love the concept of him be, uh, becoming, like, a biker dude. Because now he has his burn cycle to go alongside him. So, this is a Ruptor, but as a biker... It's a cool concept, not perfect in execution. I would have added a little bit more. I would have gave, you know, his jacket, um, badges and all that. As if he even has a jacket. I can't remember. Does he have a jacket? That's one um, other thing about Lava Lance Raptor. He's not the most memorable. But say, you know, having badges and just going full into the biker culture could have made him even cooler than he already is. But 49 is going to be Shark Shooter Terrafin. Now, just about the only problem I have with this guy is that his moves flow together about as well as the original did, so they don't. But, having a shark cannon is much more creative than just having a character that punches, and the shark cannon is a lot more fun and fast-paced as well. Uh, so, Shark Shoot Terrafin is just a character I enjoy a lot more than the original. Uh, the design does get a little blocky, there's not too many interesting shapes and textures on it, and the colours don't really contrast each other nicely either. And yet still, the figurine is better than the original, because there's that intimidation factor behind it. And not to mention, the blocky armour really gives him that earth type aesthetic, but it's also more creative than just yet another rock golem. So, Shark Shooter Terrafin truly is a character effective in combat, and really fun on the figurine, even if it has its minor flaws. Now, 58 is going to be Ambush. My god, do I love this character. His design is so detailed. You cannot witness this figure and not absorb all of the intricate things that build him up but his gameplay gets even better because you have to be patient with him and yet you are rewarded for standing around and doing nothing you could argue that it is a slow paced but just the idea of risking getting hit so you can power up your sword is an awesome concept and the animations too they take from classic uh like ancient martial arts from China and Japan and all that, so they've built up a tree warrior with a very awesome looking sword, a sheer amount of detail on the figurine, and a pose that, you know, again is derived from those ancient martial arts. He's a figurine that the developers poured a lot of passion and heart into, he's an absolute powerhouse unit that demands uh, patience and rewards your strategy in combat and his moves flow you can go from bamboo dash into his sword strike very easily you can create a bamboo shield uh, make that be exploded all around you and just uh, give you an aura of damage with a bamboo he is ridiculously fun and fast paced but Rattle Shake is better coming in at 47 because he can create little mini snakes that slow down enemies and then you can, uh, you know, absolutely ravage them further with your projectile attacks. Like, just as you thought this guy couldn't get any better, you discover new abilities, new strategies with him that makes him even better than that. Rattle Shake is a powerhouse for Skanda and you can even, like, use a jumping ability 
What? That's unique and creative for Rattle Shake, but it knocks back enemies and gives you even more ease at defeating them. Every single tool leans back to Rattle Shake being a powerhouse and it works. He's also the only snake where you actually see the snake for his bottom half. And changing that as a swapper is really cool. Uh, he's even a homage to classic westerns with obviously the accent, the cowboy hat. He's just a figurine that works really well for me and there's some nice sharp contrast and colours. My problem is his soul gem and the fact that they work so hard to make these awesome colours from a figurine and then you don't even see them for the most part in the gameplay. Like at least for Rubble Rouser when they changed up his colours they improved it because for Black's Rubble Rouser looks so much more cooler from his soul gem. But Rattle Shake doesn't have that same oomph with the soul gem and it's also an uninspired soul gem like you change his appearance and give him extra armour. Wow, so creative. We've never seen that done before. But moving on to 46, we have Fist Bump. Every single move flows back into one another. You cannot use one move without it benefiting another. And that is such a classic moveset style. We do have yet another Rock Golem, but him having really unique fists and also for intricate details on his body makes him a little more memorable than the other rock golems in my personal opinion but say because the moves that get so overpowered when you combine the moves efficiently you have all of these trick wires which when you pound the ground they create spikes and increase your damage yeah that's insane um but you walk around and create trick wires by default which also spawn bamboo that heals you so simply by walking you create extra damage and get healing that is ridiculous ridiculously broken but speaking of ridiculously broken characters coming in at 45 is Thunderbolt let me get this off my shoulders right away this is a character that first of all I've definitely warmed up a lot to more over the years as I've upgraded him and gotten better with his new set but I still feel as though his design at the time it was definitely something basic like it felt limited by the developers almost a last minute type design and he's also another trap master with a Traptanium sword and of all of the swords he has the most dull one. There's too many trap masters with swords, which works against uh, Thunderbolt's favor, I suppose. So his design feels basic, uh, basic, and, and as though there's more that needs to be added to it. Like there's an expansion upon his design, which we'll talk about later. But for now, yeah, his design isn't the greatest. But his gameplay, on the other hand, being able to combine your sword swings with obviously like tornadoes and storm clouds. It makes him a powerhouse of the unit because he stacks up damage so quickly, so easily. Unfortunately, he's not the most maneuverable of characters, but the fact that he gets hit quite easily is compensated for with his health bar. So overall, he's ridiculously power uh, powerful. Like, in early difficulties, enemies aren't even going to get a chance to hit you despite the lack of maneuverability because you're killing them too quickly. So he certainly is a fun character in-game. His moves flow. They can be a little slow-paced based on his lack of maneuverability. But outside of that... Thunderbolt was fantastic, but now we're going to move on to 44, which is Stormblade. Uh, my favourite chase variant comes from her for Snow Bright Stormblade, or at least she is one of my favourite chase variants anyway. But what's great about her is how fast-paced she is, because you can mash uh, her blades, and it makes her feel so quick, how fast she launches them off, and the fact that they feel quicker than your even mashing buttons, even though they aren't, but they just feel that way. And the sound effects on top of that, you know, you truly feel the blades being uh, thrown off by her. And because of how quick she is, and her maneuverability too, like, she can defeat enemies from afar with her very quick projectiles. That's so, that was so much fun to mash, similar to Trick Happy. But also, whenever enemies get close, you can just so easily dash away. It is ridiculously broken how good this character is and how well her moves flow together. You can dash into a, a crowd of enemies and use her tertiary attack, and you can dash away and single in on enemies with her projectiles. Once again, you can tackle each combat scenario differently, and that keeps her gameplay feeling fresh. It's so good. And speaking of characters who are so good, we have Barbella, who's also one of the few single most underrated Skarners in the entirety of the franchise. Because her moves flow together and they're insanely powerful, you can draw in enemies with her clap, which creates these rocks which are launched off by her primary attacking combinations, which also knock back enemies, and then you can chain that into a block which deals damage when you summon it, and then when you launch it off, it deals another wave of damage, and then you can transition that into a jump and attack which deals, uh, you know, 80 damage twice over so that's 160 damage and point is the damage stacks everything flows it's so fast paced boy Barbella is one hell of a powerhouse and my only flaw of her which is what makes her so underrated 
is for lackluster design. All they did was they took rock golems from past and they made another one. Wow, guys, real original. So yeah, her design is nothing to write home about, but please get over the design and pick her up anyway because she's one of the cheapest senseis. And yet, you're going to get a bang for your buck given how powerful and how fun she is. Now for 42, we have finally cracked the top quarter of ranking list, and that's Firecracken. Now this is a character whose design alone carries him, because for colours, really contrast and pop, he feels like a Chinese parade dragon, which is exactly what he's based off of, so having that um, Chinese-inspired design is really cool. And say the colours, they contrast each other so sharply and he stands out on the shelf for it. And you get to see his wild side with his tongue sticking out. There's so much personality poured into this figurine. And his gameplay is bouncy and wild as well. It makes sense for a swap skill. And to say his gameplay isn't fun is an understatement. I love how he obviously twirls around his fire uh, staff. He has his parade dragon which has a fun sound effect to it. So it leans back to that Chinese culture. And say the attacks are fun. It's fun to pull off those attacks. I'm saying this twice. Repetition for effect and all that. The effect to be uh, to put emphasis on the very thing I'm repeating. But it's not very powerful. Unfortunately Firecracker is one of those characters that can get killed off really easily because his... Uh, attacks aren't as powerful as they need to be and they're a bit too short ranged and it's a shame because you want to play this character longer because you're having so much fun and yet the damage output just doesn't make him efficient and that's my flaws for this guy if he was more powerful he would be even further up the list but for 41 we have Cobra Kadabra yet again another character who is significantly um increased on this list since the last one with good reason first of all the name is just fun to say there's so many a's in there cobra kadabra is brilliant truly and being a snake is so much more creative than one might think because obviously route shake came before him oh my another snake so creative it is he's detailed his texture his texture is amazing he's a completely different snake because rattle shake is a diamond back rattle snake he's a king cobra Y you know, there's still creativity to be had there. Not to mention, he has a basket rather than making him long and dull shaped, um, unlike Blastermind. Because, like I said, I don't like the long and thin designs. Instead, there's some bulkiness and some power to Cobra Kadabra. And his flute, again, adds a lot more creativity and makes him more distinctive as a character. But there's just such a rhythm to his gameplay. You gotta keep in tune to remain being more powerful. And even when you aren't at the peak of his power, he is still so insanely effective in combat. You can leave behind a pool of snakes to stack up your damage. And then, obviously, the flute has its own range of abilities and powers and just things it's capable of. So there's plenty of stuff you can do with this character. Whilst also being powerful at the same time, he is a blast to play as. It's a minor flaw to say that, oh, it's another snake character. But coming in at the 40th spot, top 40, is Camo. Man, this guy's wow power is overpowered, and it allows his attacks to flow even more well together, because he can create firecracker vines, and that can go straight into his watermelon burst. And you know what? If those create explosive pumpkins that create further um, chains of attacks, his uh, primary attack works well on top of that, you can mash it, sure, but what you want with this character is efficient spacing, because that way you can heal up with efficient spacing and not, you know, have your uh, aura dealt damage to enemies, but even then, you know, you can create this healing aura, and if enemies come close to you, that deals damage to them, and so, sure, you've lost the healing ability, but at least you're dealing damage to enemies in the process, but say, having the perfect uh, spacing and being rewarded with that with the damage output from your firecracker finds it's great and when you can combine that with just a huge chain of explosive pumpkins brought about by his wow pal it makes him even more overpowered and he's a really um standout figurine in the fact that he has reds he has yellows he has greens and that's far more colors pumped into a single figurine than what most other figurines possess it's a really sharp color palette that works very well to make this figurine stand out. His texturing is incredible and there's so much detail. He is easily one of the best looking figurines from Spyro's Adventure and Fawnhorn Camo takes everything from the original camo that works and dials it to 11. It's so easy to see why this character is beloved. He is yet another dragon, but he's so much more creative than other dragons because like Bash, he has no wings. His tertiary attack is an absolute waste because it's an actual attack this way. So yeah, there's definitely uh, some highlights to be said about Camo, and he's still not even um, past the top 40, so that goes to show how good characters like Grave Clobber are. Uh, I love the bandages, it makes for a really well-presented figurine, he looks uh, really detailed, 
And his attacks flow together so well. He's the perfect brawling character because he's fast paced. He really stacks up the damage. He feels like a brawler. Enemies are being messed with as, you know, you're pulling off all sorts of combinations that they don't have a chance in escape and you're frustrating them with your capabilities and what you, you're able to do with them. He also rewards uh, learning his moveset strategy because you can actually hold a primary attack button, create a bunch of water geysers in front of you, but obviously like that leaves you exposed. Well, you can jump out of it, leave the water geysers, um, and not leave yourself vulnerable. Genius if you learn it. And, and say, you know, that chains into his primary attacks, which whilst in the air he has a kick, and those attacks power up your water geysers, and he has a belly flop, which knocks back enemies and acts as a projectile. This character has a tool for every situation. As a sensei, he's inherently overpowered. His design and his figurine are great. What is there to complain about Grave Clobber? Absolutely nothing. Love this guy. But 38 is going to be Chain Reaction, a design I love even more because it's so detailed, the texturing, uh, the texturing is fantastic. I mean, he has dual chainsaws for Pete's sake, and he has a beard made of chains. They take the chain in his name, quite literally. He probably has the best design of any Skarner, and I do not say that mildly. His design is fantastic, his figurine is fantastic, and that alone is enough for 38. On top of that, you also get some really good combinations in-game. Uh, his style you know dealing small damage to enemies but having that build up and the fact that it's you know constant damage you deal to co damage constantly it's a unique style it does stack up uh, his animations are great especially for combination animations and say he definitely has plenty of tools to tackle situations with you can even draw in enemies with his uh, fan blades after a couple of upgrades he's not the most effective sensei I will admit, he's not as powerful as the other ones, and that does make him a little disappointing. But, like Firecracken, I'm willing to forgive for lack of damage output, even though it is ultimately what led to him only being 38. Now, 37, I say 38 like uh, it's not much of an accomplishment, but what we have for 37 at long last is Star Strike. Again, this is nothing to scoff at. This is a great achievement, and Star Strike definitely deserves it. She increases your concentration within the game tenfold and you wind up more immersed in this world thanks to this character's playstyle and the uniqueness of it. She's the only character on the Swap Force who can jump in midair. That's unique and memorable. Her design, eh, it's fine. I mean, a dress character with some fans, sure. But the design being the weakest element of it just goes to show how good the gameplay is if she can still be this high up on the list because obviously she has fast projectiles which work in, them, uh, in and of themselves. For the secondary attack even works in and of itself because it spins all around you, damage is dealt all around you, so it's great for crowd control. But when you combine the two things, the fact that you have to time projectile to maintain its power, and the fact that you uh, have to be effective and use other attacks whilst you wait for it to return, and then you still need to anticipate its return, you're constantly throwing out attacks. There is never a dull moment with this character. She's fun, she's overpowered, she's everything you want in a good Skarner, besides maybe. Um, for design needing a little bit more oomph but i do love the color contrast there so the light core also works really well in fact that her eyes light up and now we move on to pop fawn at 36 boy does does, does this character have a moveset that can flow you have two different forms and it's so easy to transition between the two of them and in fact you get reward of transition in between the two of them because the more you do that um you get your sli uh, attacks slightly buffed um for the first few seconds, you're in each form, so that's great. Uh, obviously, mines you poop out in his smaller form remain when you go into his bigger form, so creating traps and just sitting about and letting enemies be fooled by them is satisfying, and it works no matter what. Uh, I'm glad that they kept that in, because that would have been such a big nerf to take away his um, mines when you switch. But say, he's fast-paced and he's investive in terms of investing you further into the game just because there's so much mashing going on there's so much uh, combining of skills going on that you have fun whilst also being effective and being immersed in his moveset because you can't just go in button mashing and being all willy-nilly he loses a lot of his power very quickly if you don't constantly switch between his forms both forms of which are incredibly cute so you want to use both forms but we're going to move on to 35 without further ado which is airstrike the greatest brawling sensei because he takes everything great about Grave Club and dials it to 11, plus his design is sick. There are sharp blades that make him uh, feel like a tried and true brawler that would be absolutely beast in combat, but just having 
a little um, bird trainer and a massive bird itself, uh, you know, one that's bigger than the base of the figurine. It is so cool. It's not the most personality driven design, I will give it that, but it's still cool. The facial hair on Airstrike is cool. They really gave him like this old Asian um, martial arts master type look, which is important because these are senseis. They have things to teach and Airstrike looks like he has something to teach. Mainly, he has something to teach his bird. And then you get into the gameplay. So you've not only had the really thoughtful, creative and in intricate design, and a variant that works with a color palette and creates for a very sharply contrasting um, and figurine that really pops and stands out on the shelf. But we've heard this time and time again. What we want to talk about is how well Airstrike's moves flow together. He can draw people in with his tertiary, which can be done midway through creating diamonds, uh, which obviously your bird slams down, they all explode and they just create a pool of death all around you. And that also speeds you up so you can outmaneuver enemies. Whilst in that, you can press primary attack button too uh, to deal increased damage and that throws out projectiles all around you. It's just point is, all enemies are roped into your attacks that obliterate them. They have no choice but taking your combination to the face and they can't tank damage. Airstrike is better than them. He teases them. The combat is fun, fast paced. It all organically flows and it's everything you want in the perfect brawling sensing. Coming in at number 34 is Turbocharged Donkey Kong. To even see a Nintendo character in Skarners is such a huge honour, and the fact that they took a classical design and they managed to make the best of both worlds, and the fact that we still get the classic character we still love, but it's also been Skylanderified in a way to make him fit amongst the Skarners cast, it's the absolute perfect collaborative type design and the moveset reflects that too because you have a character who's really fun his animations are really crisp and polished but above all you know he's throwing barrels you know he's tossing them but then he also initiates his giga mode where he can bring down the stage of the uh, um, original Donkey Kong arcade machine like to go back and reference an arcade game that is this old in a game that's generally targeted towards a much younger demographic so that now all age rangers can enjoy this character. It's such geniusness, it also helps that Turbocharged Donkey Kong is an incredibly OP character in the game. He is fun, he is effective in combat because he defeats enemies so quickly and with so much ease. There is just few things I have to complain about this character, even his colours contrast each other nicely, they pop and make him stand out. So above all, it's just an excellent example of how to take a classical design and skylanderify it, but for 33 I have Magnet Charge, a character who makes it so much fun to use magnets because you can just pick up an enemy and yeet them off the edge of a stage. That is effective, it's fun and it's ridiculous how overpowered it is, but all of his other attacks are great too, he has a great personality on top of it all. The reds and the greens really contrast each other very nicely and he also has a little bit of silver thrown in there to give him a uh, a more magnetism sense so it makes sense you could go as far to say uh, with all of his magnets let's say even his gun is known as a magnet gun so matter charge is just an insanely cool character with a nice design for wheel for bomb half a singular wheel at that a little bit too similar to bouncer but magnet charge still has enough differences and besides this attacks actually utilize the wheel unlike bounce where it's just a design element so magnet charge expands upon that idea makes it even better and say it's just how effective and funny he is in combat that makes magnet charge as strong of a tech character as he is. Now for 32 I have Spotlight and man what a fantastic character this is indeed. She creates sonic rings that she can uh, spin around her laser with and that laser in of itself is incredibly overpowered but you don't only need to worry about uh, distance and obviously you need to calculate how long it's going to take for your laser to spin around so that kind of math keeps you concentrated and immersed in the game even further. But on top of that, you can also use close range abilities such as her tertiary to stack up damage even further and make it even more efficient. Her design is very unique. There isn't another dragon scander that has like rings in her wings and so she just has a really nice shape to her, especially her base, and she's overpowered in game, so what more is there to ask for from our only ever liked core character? Now 31 is going to be Pain Yada. Boy, this character is amazing, especially for figurine. The texturing is excellent, and his gameplay is seriously, seriously 
overpowered. Uh, first of all, it flows together pretty nicely and it can be pretty fast paced, but it is uneven paced. It can go from being slow to being fast uh, very quickly and so that just really draws your attention to the slow paced uh, segments of this combat. But, you know, that's a, that's a nitpick uh, for inconsistent pacing. And I say it's a nitpick because the rest of the gameplay is so good. Like I say, he's overpowered, he's fun, his moves do make sense, and they're a great reference back to his trap team counterpart. And his figurine is not just for texturing, but for sharp contrast and colours. There is so much colour poured into this figurine, and it really stands out because it pops for yellows, for greens, for blues, for purples. There's just there's so many different colours on there. Even for spiralling lollipop, it's a very memorable looking design. So Peñada literally stands out for all the right reasons. So now we get to kick off our top 30 with none other than Shortcut. A character whose design is incredibly well detailed, he has scars and cuts all over him that no doubt come from his massive Traptanium scissors, which are bigger than he is. To have the size of a corp with a Traptanium weapon that's one of the biggest is so creative. And he's a ragdoll, obviously these are created using scissors that snip and thread and needle and that's what Shortcut does, he's an arts and crafts expert, he literally crafts and summons little mini um, shortcuts which is adorable and say his thread needle and his scissor attacks they come together very nicely and they create just a chain of overpoweredness, it's a loop of damage that the enemies cannot evade because Shortcut is just simply better than all of them. He also has an excellent chase variant, so overall Shortcut is just a design that is so lovable, so thought through and creative, and gameplay on top of it which really rewards mashing, strategy, a blend and balance of both of those, and it gets all the more overpowered the more combination of attacks you use as well as the better you mash, like it's so satisfying to mash and sniff along the way uh, for sound effects even, not only do they make sense for scissors, but they add to the fun of actually snipping in the first place. Now coming in for 29 we have Scorp, who is one hell of a fast paced character indeed. His role is not only infinite thanks to his soul gem ability, but it can also be used to knock back enemies, and whilst they're knocked back, obviously you can lob at them and your little poison orb thing with bobs, they explode over time and deal damage to everything around them, so even when you miss your attacks can become effective. The poison tail tra uh, is transitioned into quite nicely, it doesn't necessarily flow as a moveset, but it works as one complete package, all of the attacks feel appropriate for the character, and this design is pretty cool too, there is a lot of blocky colours, so a lot of browns and not too much to contrast said browns, but it's still fine and the posing is really cool, he looks very heroic and intimidating for any of his enemies, so it's definitely a character you want to pick up and play, but ultimately, he's a very good character, fast paced, fun, overpowered, everything you want for a Skarner really. His rolling is a little bit derivative of Bash's attacks but he's like Bash but even better as he has stronger projectiles, an even more helm of strategy that's required to play as him so he's more immersive in that way and Scorp overall is just a powerhouse of a unit and so much fun to play even though when compared to other Skarners like Wolfgang he's not nearly as good since Wolfgang, well you can create speakers, and those speakers are dealing consistent damage. But then you can also use his bow and arrow, and whilst you're using that, more arrows are thrown out of his speakers. So now you have the double damage from both the speakers, and the arrows being thrown from speakers, and uh, you also have the arrows themselves. So if you single out and hone in on an enemy, they are defeated in mere seconds. Or you can have really easy crowd control, you can knock back enemies with his slide. There's just so many things about his moveset that bring out his personality as well as an absolute overpowered werewolf. Like, yeah, having a werewolf as a rocker it kind of makes sense. When they go, ah, woo! It sounds almost musical, as you heard from my excellent replication of it right now. So, say, Wolfgang is just a character brimming with personality, and his moveset really does take advantage of it, in my personal opinion, to create for really overpowered sensei that's intricate moves really combined together to create just a wave of overpoweredness. I almost feel sorry for enemies when I fight against them as Wolfgang. Almost, anyway. Now for 27 we have what is the best book in my personal opinion, Boom Jet. Wow, only a 27A. Eh? That goes to show how great all the other Skarners uh, that are coming up as they're even better than the best swapper of them all. So with Boom Jet it's great because you can call in um, obviously your 
airstrikes, not literal airstrikes, but say they can deal really good damage everything in front of you and then with your bombs yeah you have less maneuverability whilst it's charged but unleashing that is so satisfying and it also has for knockback and for satisfying sound effects so it's very risky charging up a bomb and leaving yourself vulnerable but most of the time it works out and those bombs are also are used in the physical figure in itself and they really add to the sharp color contrast he really stands out on the shelf because he looks like a rocketeer which is appropriate for a skill type and so all these moves flow together he's incredibly fast paced as an air swapper and so much fun but for 26 i have prison break a very overlooked character you could go as far to say because his moves are far more intricate than people let on you can't just mash his primary attack and win you have to combine that with his crystals all of a sudden you have the series 2 wow power where you can send a power beam through your regular lasers and now you have it split nine ways and you're dealing like 200 damage to nine enemies at once. And when enemies are defeated, they create their own crystals which can be reflected through. So all of a sudden, literally everything in front of you with the utilization of two attacks is crystal summon, which deals initial damage. And then you reflect this laser through that, create the beam, and boom, everything in front of you is just dead. No matter the difficulty, they are dead. His character is ridiculously overpowered and fun. And he maintains your concentration in the game, your, your immersion, because you can't just flick your brain off and mash buttons, you have to actually think about the math and the angles. It's a very clever move set. the design is also pretty cool, and one that clearly influenced the later things in Skyrim. It's like, for example, the trap sculpts clearly um, are just like Prism Breaks, uh, Prism Hands, so to say. He's a crystalline Skyrim, and they are Trapanian crystals, those traps. So say, Prism Break definitely has so many strengths that people overlook just because he's slow and even then he walks slow he certainly isn't slow in combat because his combat is immersive and increases your concentration in the game itself so his gameplay is never stale he's never slow when he's in combat now for 25 i have chopper boy chopper is so overpowered his uh dino destruction is called that for good reason because he absolutely obliterates enemies with that soul gem there is just dozens upon dozens of missiles and rockets on the screen and that onslaught is destructive and knowing that you're the one who caused it is beyond satisfactory His design is really clever, I mean he's a helicopter Tyrannosaurus Rex for Pete's sake. He is adorable but also intimidating all at the same time. Everything transitions into his secondary attack nicely as he can blade down forward, uh, deal stupid damage and also knock back enemies. And his roar is very nice as well, very cute and appropriate as T-Rex's uh, roar, at least that's what the Jurassic World franchise would have you believe. But say, Chopper. Definitely a powerhouse for Skarna, and one that is so satisfying to play as, and I love his design. Would have been great for a tech giant, but he didn't quite fit the patch, did he? So is why he makes a perfect core instead. Now for 24, I have Bone Bash Rollerball. Man, this is a supercharger revamp done right, even though we haven't even seen the regular Rollerball yet. So they've taken a really great Skarna. And made her just as great the second time around. How do you replicate that? Well, only in the hands of a bone bashing badass. Yes, I used the alliteration there because this character has a moveset that seriously flows together. It is so fast paced and organic. Like one move, after that, you just naturally transition into the next. You can't help yourself. Um, it feels unnatural to just mash attacks with this character, and that makes it so much fun. Plus, she has healing abilities, which add even more power because she cannot be defeated when she's constantly healing, now can she? So she can dash forward with great speed, she can transition into a melee combinations, which are very well animated and polished and crisp looking. So there is all this destruction on screen and it's so satisfying knowing that you're the one who's capable of it all. Her design is also excellent. She has uh, blades all over her, this bone type armor which really makes her look like this ruffian and this uh, brawler type character. And it's definitely someone you want to pick up and play as because she looks like a force to be reckoned with. 
And trust me, she is in combat. She's an absolute speed demon. And she's so appropriate for Superchargers too because she's so fast paced for that game. Playing as her never makes a game feel slow because she's like Stormblade but on steroids and with melee attacks. So you're rewarded for up close and personal combat. But coming in at 23 is Chompy Mage. Now this is one seriously, seriously overpowered sensei villain because you can spawn in chompies with your bazooka and this is even more funnier yet when you see fellow chompies you almost get confused between the two of them but still uh those chompies that have been summoned well they deal constant damage to enemies and you can also use your chompy puppet to knock back enemies and you can go into your little ball and charge forward and really stack up damage incredibly quickly the amount of just chaos you can cause to ensue and ultimately obliterate your enemies makes Chompy Mage ridiculously overpowered, incredibly satisfying to play as, and it's just really honourable to own such a rare figurine, I must be honest, if I'm going to pay this much for Chompy Mage, I better like him, and trust me, I like him. But moving on to 22, we have Skyner Gamer TV's favourite, Blastatron. Kind of easy to see why he's a favourite, to be honest, given that his gameplay not only flows together and is not only fast paced, but it's also incredibly effective because enemies are defeated before they even have a chance at hitting you. All of his attacks flow together so well, and his animations are incredibly crisp. He feels futuristic because he really brings out his design through his gameplay. Well, his personality for his design and his gameplay, I should say, because this character is a futuristic robot, and so having that design and the personality um, to accompany that, it all just feels so complete and thoroughly thought through. But say, when it comes down to his gameplay, you can charge attacks, you can do combination attacks, um, there is no shortage of ways you can absolutely obliterate your enemies, it's almost embarrassing the, uh, you know, destruction you put him through with this character. He even does some attacks automatically, like his sky beam, oh! He's so good, I'm telling you, but not quite as good as our 21 pick, which is going to be a flame slinger. Yeah, he slings flames, but he's also incredibly fast-paced because he can run on fire. And any sort of crowd control business is easy because you can just run around in circles. Yeah, you literally run circles around your enemies. That is so taunting and fast-paced and brilliant. But you also have the onslaught projectiles you can use, and it's very risk and reward to use this volley shot because you could miss, but if you land it, it's so satisfactory. And it can be so overpowered too because you can defeat enemies before they even have the chance of getting up close and personal with you. So Flame Slinger basically has the tools for every situation. He's a blaster player, and he has a great design too. I mean, he even has a massive man bun on his head, which is something I admire because I love myself a glorious head of hair. And that is one thing Flame Slinger 1000% possesses. So, he's a great character, just shy of a top 20, which is going to be kicked off by Gear Shift. Yeah, she's a great trap master, I think it's quite self-explanatory what makes her so good. Uh, first of all, the mashing is incredibly satisfactory, for the same reason as Trick Happy is. With her, though, you actually have to aim. With Trick Happy, you can just be kind of, like, aimless and still be victorious. Not the same for Gear Shift here, but obviously she has different modes of attacks and different strategies for each combat scenario, as you can use either a Hula Hoop her to like Swashbuckle and Blades, or you can kick a blade for a projectile attack. And so the fact that you're constantly switching this up makes her gameplay loop really refreshing. But ultimately, why use anything else when you have projectile? Because it's so fast, it's so satisfying to mash, it's really rewarding, especially when you can aim it. And it absolutely obliterates everything in front of it. You also leave behind little gears uh, whenever you do those attacks or you cartwheel. And then you can transition that into your hula hooping attack and throw gears at enemies with um, those gears that are left on the ground. They kind of bounce up and down and deal extra damage like how Barbella's rock. Uh, works or for rocks she creates when she claps for two hands together so this moveset flows organically in that manner the same way as it does for Barbella but in an even more overpowered way just as you thought you couldn't get any better so that's what makes gear shift worthy of the 20th spot but coming in at 19 is the best villain sensei Taekwon Crow I love his personality he is such a fun character on a personality scale alone and then you have the gameplay on top of that 
yeah, he has a significantly low health bar for a sensei, but that's because enemies don't even get close. They are defeated so early on because you have knockback damage. You have increased damage with your fire circle, uh, which is very well animated, by the way. It looks crisp and polished. So he's a character whose visuals and personality you want to watch and fall before you because they're so captivating and memorable. Well, his character is for dictionary definition of memorable. His colours really contrast, make, uh, and contrast even and make for a nice uh, looking figurine that stands out on the shelf. You know, for typical, for typical things I have to say um, to compliment these skanders with. This character is so overwhelmingly good that it's making me stutter left, right and centre. Um, there is no summing up how good this guy is with just words. But going back to the moveset here, you can increase your damage with that fire roundhouse kick and throw your blades through it, deal increased damage, but you can also charge them up. They knock back enemies and then they return back to you. So that's a double wave of damage, which is ridiculously high. We're talking about 250 damage for a projectile. Yes, this character is ridiculous. I'm yelling about it because I'm passionate about it. Taekwondo Pro. Best villain sensei. I would say by miles, he's very close to Plastitron and Chomping Mage because, like I say, these uh, last 25 characters have all been really compact as to how good they are, but Tycoon Crow just barely, and I mean barely, edges them out. Now, number 18 is going to be Robo, a character that you kind of have to like because he is worth like 300 pounds and many people don't have him, so last thing you want to do is rub salt and Faroon and say, Oh, I don't like this character that you can't even afford because it's 300 pounds and most people can't afford that. It has nothing to do with being rich or poor. <laughs> with me, it had to do with luck because I found a very generous eBay seller who took up my offer for 60 pounds uh, about three years ago is when I bought it. But still, uh, I think it's about time I went back to the design and personality of this guy. The design is excellent. I mean, he's a robot with a burnt arrow. Robo. Genius pun. It's clear that they came up with a pun before they came up with a design, but rather than one of those characters where the best thing about him is the pun, in this case, like, they made the pun really work because the design is even better than the pun. It's so intricately detailed, there's so many great textures to it, the sharp colour contrast is amazing. He is by far one of the coolest designs of any Skarner. He even has a singular robot eye like Shockwave from Transformers and I have no problems with that uh, small hint of inspiration whatsoever. It's okay to be inspired as long as you're not derivative and trust me, he looks nothing like Shockwave with the exception of the singular eye. Which, is, which isn't even a drawn attention to because of the hood which looks a little bit like, well, Robin Hood! So say, they bring all these elements together to make a really nice looking figurine with a great design and a nice sharp contrasting colour palette. And then his gameplay gets even better because it's fast paced. Everything, and I mean everything, flows together nicely. He's OP on top of it all. Uh, he, he literally throws off an onslaught of lasers for his soldier mobility, which is just as, if not even more overpowered than Chopper's. Yeah. This guy is fantastic, there's no doubt about that in my mind, which is why he's getting number 18 on the list, and he's definitely worth every single penny I paid for him. Now for number 17, I've played the best Trap Team Core, because of all of the Trap Team Cores, his moveset demands the most strategy, uh, it has the most reward for you, obviously, chaining attacks together because they blow really well. You can create just a bunch of blades in front of you, you can use this combination to launch them forward as projectiles, and then that combination also knocks back enemies, and then you can chain that into a jumping attack, and then you can go back, do a tornado. And that's just one singular strategy. Say so these chain of attacks reward your strategy. They are very satisfying to pull off, and they flow organically to make for a fast-paced character whose design is excellent. I mean, at the end of the day, he's an amalgamation of a knight and a dragon. Knights hunt dragon and folklore, so to have a design that combines both um, the hunter and the hunt e in a way, because let's be honest, knights don't stand a chance against dragons, and when they go to hunt them, they turn out to be the ones that are hunted. But regardless, there's so much fine irony work there, which is creative, it's clever, there's a sharp um, contrast and colour palette brought about by the intricate details in the armour itself. He feels sharp and intimidating, which you should as a character literally named Blades. His character is fantastic, there's no denying it, but for number 16 I have the best supercharger, which is obviously Hammerslam Bowser, how could it be anyone other than him? He takes everything great about um, Turbocharged Donkey Kong, and dials it to 11, because Hammerslam Bowser, well, his design is great. The shell having spikes all over it, and the green and the whites and reds, they all contrast each other nicely even, and create for an excellent texture. 
but they gave Bowser armor and a hammer, which really makes him fit in well with the rest of the Skylanders cast. And then he can summon Koopas. He can um, enter his Giga form. Every part of his moveset is brought about by some inspiration behind the classical character, which is really clever. And his attacks stack, they flow, and it makes him really fast paced because he can obviously um, use his hammer to launch his Koopas off in their shell forms. So you can either have uh, green ones that ricochet everywhere or red ones that hone in on enemies like they do in Mario Kart. It's clever, it's so much fun, it's fast paced, it's everything I want in the best supercharger ever created. And the figurine. Double functionality as an amoeba on a scanner is literal cherry on top of the cake. There is very few things I find wrong with this character. He is so much fun. I suppose his giga form is a little more slow paced than the rest of his gameplay. But given how narrative it is, you truly feel the raw power behind it. And it is so much fun. But for number 15, I have Wildstorm. Now, I said earlier about um, Thunderbolt really feeling like a basic rendition of that concept well wildstorm expands upon that concept they give him a greater sword a greater attention to detail more texturing and components to make the figurine just all the more grand in scope and detail it's one that really stands out for all the right reasons not only the contrast and colors and the details and the texturing and the weaponry and the armor and every intricate like painting tool that goes into crafting those but he also has such a personality driven pose, he looks angry, ready to conjure up a storm and absolutely obliterate his enemies with said storm because his character is seriously overpowered, his moves flow together very well. Of the eight base elements, Air has for one with the lowest best scan of his respective element, that being Milestone, which you see before you. But that still means that um, all eight of the base elements can be found in the top 15, and Wildstorm deserves to kick off the top 15 based on how well his attacks flow, how overpowered they are, how appropriate they are for figuring themselves. Like I say, it's everything that's great about Thunderbolt, which is a lot of things, and it dials it to 11. This is a character who's an 11 out of 10, and we still have 14 more masterpieces to go, because that's the thing, like these top 15 characters, they're in a league all of their own. These are what I call the perfect 15. And the next one on that list is going to be Bumble Blast for best life scan in my personal opinion. Because how can he not be? You can fire off bees anywhere on screen and they will hone in on enemies. You honey eyes enemies, they are slowed down and they're dealt increased damage to by the bees. You can also create a mine which can roll into enemies, create a trap for them as they try to engage you and you do a strategic retreat and now they're covered in honey, they're dealt huge damage, they're knocked back. You know, every single tool in this character's moveset is what I define as OP. The only problem I have with this character is maybe that his design is a little lacklustre given that he's yet another tree which we've seen done time and time again in the Skylanders universe. But as unique, he has a bee's hive as a mouth and he has a honey like gun that fires off bees. It's so much more unique than other tree designs. Um, you know, it's kind of like an expansion upon what made those designs great to make this one for a refined, perfect version of that. Bumble Blast, well. For clues in the name there, he's an absolute blast to play us. But number 13 is going to be Tideball. Oh man, do I love how well animated his character is and how well her attacks flow. She can kick squids, she can summon whales, and all of those attacks, you know, they kind of cause enemies to be congregated and packed into one single area, so you can hone in on them. But even when they are all spread out, you spin with your uh, double ink pistols and just destroy crowds. Overall, she is a moveset that flows together really well. She is very well animated. And that's just the gameplay portion of her, which is so invested in. There is also the figurine, which has one of the best poses of all of the sensei. It's very intimidating and agile. It's a character that you want to pick up and play as. But the detail is second to none. She truly feels like a marine creature because she is built up of all of these different things from the ocean, like the seaweed hair, the coral helmet, um, you know, the scaly pants she has. Man, she is such a cool character. You look up the dictionary definition of cool, and what you find is Tideball. But coming in at number 12 is Pop Fizz. So much more better than his supercharger revamp version, because in this original version, there's a risk to initiate the beast form. You have a long um, wind-up and cooldown effect, but in that beast mode, you 
just ravage your enemies. Your attacks are fast paced, well animated, and it's so much fun to unleash the beast, even given the risks in the first place. It adds to a risk and reward strategy. You are constantly concentrating when playing with this character. He's just, like I say, a literal beast. He's so much fun, and you can even combine his potions for chain reaction type um, effects, and it makes his gameplay all the more compelling and overpowered. If there ever was a giant's core that I would play, no doubt, and know that I would have fun, it's Pop Fizz, as well as obviously for a character in the top 10, which we haven't touched upon yet. But we're going to get into the number 11th spot, literally just short of my top 10 favourite Skylanders. And that, it is Wildfire. Yeah, he's uh, dropped out of the top 10, I'm afraid. But 11 is pretty darn close. And what this guy possesses is combinations that absolutely rip his enemies apart. He fries them up. You know, eats them for breakfast either. In fact, he can destroy enemies before breakfast because his attacks are ridiculously overpowered. The animations are crisp and fine looking. There's so much personality behind the figurine. It's textured to be just like a lion, but a golden metallic one, which is really intimidating. So for texturing, the detail, it just makes the figurine so attractive one you want to play as. It really attracts your eye, I should say, uh, more like... Yeah, that can be taken out of context, but still, on his shield, there is a literal face, so it is one of the most detailed Trapanian weapons out there. The design is clever, it is fun, and the gameplay takes every advantage of making it a beast out of wildfire. But now we move on to the top 10, which as you can see before you, I just have a little PNG of the top 10, because we won't be going into much depth about these characters, as I have linked in the description below, um, the updated top 10 video explaining in great detail as to why these are my top 10 favorite Skylanders. So if you want to find out why these are the top 10, you can click that link in the description below and check out my top 10 favorite Skylanders as revised for 2021. And honestly, I, I've refined this list so heavily that I can't see it changing anytime soon. That list being Roller Brawl, Zap, Double Trouble, Blair Wolf, Nightlight, Crypt King, Flashwing, Drobot, Smolder Dash, and then Igniter as our worthy number one. You can even see with a PNG before you how worthy of number one he is. I created this unique graphic for him and him alone. This character being my favorite is never gonna change. He's too damn lovable. But now I am pr proud to present my final ranking of all 167 standards having been ranked from worst to best mind you that ranking portion has came to an end so i think it's about time we brought back my face to talk about updated ranking lists so let's get to that without further ado so now that the ranking list is over i'm back here with my face to very quickly break down the new rankings so these are the 32 from spyro's adventure now this uh, so drastically changes from the original one I did because this takes into account reposes and wild power abilities. So this is basically um, how I'd rank all of the Skylanders based on all of their versions combined, rather than just for bread and butter series one versions, which I based that original ranking off. Now next are the giants uh, cores and the giant giants. Now the giant cores has actually remained the same, the only list uh, to have done so. But we're going to get them out of here, so we instead now have the swappers and the swap force cores. Uh, not too much change there, neither. Just a few uh, switches over, bits and bobs here and there. For the main note for the swappers is that Doomstone is now taken the very bottom spot, but Slobber Tooth is the main important spot for the uh, Swap Force cores. That hasn't changed. Moving on to Trap Team, we have the Trap Masters, where now Kaboom is at the very bottom, and the Trap Team cores to where Flip Greg is now at the very bottom. Every single time I play with that character, I just seems to like him a little bit less, to be perfectly honest. Lover's Design, that's the only part of the character I like. And it's rare for me to not enjoy the moveset of a Trap Team core. Even Trailblazer, which is second to last, has better gameplay. And then next up we have the Superchargers and the Senseis. Definitely two of the utmost swapped lists over for Senseis. Uh, Crash Bandicoot definitely deserves that bottom spot, unfortunately. Uh, but that being said, that has been updated. So I have one final message to end off with before we roll that outro. So let's get to it. This final message is mainly here to thank you for supporting that original video which just cracked 20,000 views, that is insane. And if you made it to this point in this ranking video, you're an absolute legend and I really appreciate it. 
So much so, in fact, that words alone can't express in full my immense gratitude towards each and every one of you. It's needless to say that this project took me about eight months in total to finish, so I'm really glad to be presenting it before you today. You've been patient with me, and I can't begin to thank you for that. Remember to keep it civil in the comment section below. Even if your character has a low ranking, remember that this is only by a hair's width, and they're still pretty close, uh, in my personal opinion, to characters 30, maybe even 40 slots ahead of them, because this ranking contains such a tight cast of characters. I still love a grand majority of these Skarners, it's what makes this such a strong and beloved franchise. For now though, I'm going to end the video. See you back here in three years from now when my opinions will no doubt have changed once again and I'll finally see Wrecking Ball for what he truly is. The single greatest character in gaming history. With that being said and done, this video is coming to an end and I want to thank you all so much for watching by merely clicking on this video. You've shown support and helped it garner recognition so it can reach many of the viewers here on YouTube. I'd love to see you take the extra step and leave a like on the video if you enjoyed. Also be sure to comment below and push that subscribe button whilst you're down there. By clicking elsewhere on screen you can either check out a video that specifically picked out for you, or you can check out the rest of the playlist for the series you just watched. Before ending off, I'd like to thank all of my Blazing Knights and Scorching Dragons whose support helped make these videos possible. I'll be seeing you in the next video, and until the moment arises, PEACE!